Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year. I hope everybody had a safe and healthy holiday. It's so good to see you guys in 2021. Um, this is our second to last session, so very exciting. We have one more after today. I'm going to start just by going over the agenda, as I usually do. Um, we're going to have you know, our brief welcome. We'll review the pre previous session um, and get some feedback. Dr. Ivy will go over Protect Your Heart from Diabetes. We'll have a Q&A and a quick break. And then we will go into our second teach back of Make Traditional African American Dishes Heart Healthy. We'll have Q&A on the teach back, and then we'll just briefly go over community activity and discussions at the end. Um, and just before we start, before I turn it over to Dr. Ivy, I do just want to um, note the disclosures for the program, which are right there on the screen for everybody. Um, and Dr. Ivy, I will turn it over to you. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. I know this is the first time that we've had a chance to meet um, since the new year. I hope that everyone had a wonderful holiday, um, a Christmas and New Year's. I hope that everyone is feeling well, and I'm so happy to see you back with us today. So very quickly, I'm just going to review some of what we discussed in the previous session. Now, it's been over a month ago, so I know that some of you are probably got tied, wrapped up in the Christmas holiday, the New Year's holiday, but we discussed cholesterol and the importance of controlling your cholesterol. Now, I did this um, sample I made um, at the last session in which you can make this from um, tools you have around the house in which it is just a paper towel tool, um, um, tube. And what I did was wrapped it around in red felt. Now, our arteries are normally open. We, when, we, when we're born, our arteries are open like this. But cholesterol, can build up in our arteries and create a situation like this, which can then hinder blood flow. So we learned that it's important to control your cholesterol. We also learned that there are several different types of fat and cholesterol that we need to think about. So we have the LDL cholesterol, that's L for lousy. We want to keep it low. That's the one that builds up in our arteries. So we want to make sure that we're keeping our LDL cholesterol low. We also learned about HDL cholesterol, that's our healthy cholesterol, and we wanna keep that high. So LDL cholesterol, lousy, keep it low. HDL cholesterol, healthy, keep it high. We also learned about the importance of controlling for triglycerides and making sure that we're keeping those in check as well. In addition to cholesterol, we learned about heart attack signs and what the heart attack signs are. It's very important that we teach our community members how to recognize if they're having a heart attack. So what those heart attack symptoms are. We also have to keep in mind that heart attack symptoms for women can be different than heart attack symptoms for men. If an individual is having a heart attack, it's important that they don't drive themselves to the hospital or they don't have someone else drive them to the hospital, but that instead they call 911. And we understood that the importance of calling 911 instead of driving yourself to the hospital is that on the ambulance, they have items that help you to deal with a heart attack before you even get to the hospital. So if someone is having a heart attack, you don't drive them to the hospital. You don't um, have them drive themselves, of course, to the hospital. We wanna call 911. Now, in addition to those two topics, we did also discuss congestive heart failure, and learned about treatments for congestive heart failure. We were fortunate enough to have doctors from the Association of Black Cardiologists teach us about what are some of those treatments for congestive heart failure and for heart disease. We know that heart disease, including congestive heart failure, disproportionately affects the African-American community. And what we're doing here in conjunction with the ABC is learning what are those strategies to really educate our community about the risk factors for heart disease, about the symptoms, signs and symptoms of heart disease to make sure that they get care quickly. Because the whole reason for this program is that we want every child to know their grandparents. And it's not until we start taking those active steps in our community that we start bending the curve in educating our community about what are the risk factors for heart disease and what are the strategies that will help us to 
control those risk factors for heart disease so that every child can know their grandparents. So that was what we discussed last month. I know it has been some time. I wanted to open it up for any questions or discussions about any of the um, sessions from last month. Does anyone have any questions about cholesterol that they want to clear up? Because we want you to, once you go out into the community to teach the manual, of course, you're, you want, we want you to stick to what the manual says, but we also want you to be able to engage the community and answer questions that they have. So if you have any questions at all at this time, um, please feel free to ask them. Okay, I don't see any questions about cholesterol or heart attack signs. So we'll move on at this time. Please feel free to chat me if you do have any questions and we will monitor the chat for any questions as we move forward with today's session. Okay, so right now then, we're going to move to the next session in the manual, which is protect your heart from diabetes. Now, today I'm going to do the session a little differently. We have given you access to the manual, you have that, and we want you to stick to what's in the manual, use what's in the manual, because the manual has been created with NHLBI and with the assistance of the Association of Black Cardiologists to really help you get the information to your community members. The manual has its sessions and it comes with picture cards. And if you are teaching the manual and you have access to Zoom or you have access to um, PowerPoint where you can do it that way, then we encourage you to use slides that you may create, use slides like I'm about to um, do with this next session. But if you don't have access to that, we still want you to teach the manuals but using the picture cards. And what you'll see is that you'll then have to tailor how you do things because you won't have all of the information that I'm about to present on the slides um, able to show to your community members. I'm gonna do it today though with slides that I created, but I want you as you begin to think about how you're going to use the manual in your community, if you're in an area where you don't have access to PowerPoint, that you incorporate those picture cards to help community members to understand. But today I am going to use a PowerPoint slide that I created um, in order to help you to understand um, the uh, manual a little better with this session. So today I'm going to talk about how to protect your heart from diabetes, protecting your heart from diabetes. And now we know that diabetes can be one of the risk factors for heart disease that we want to teach our community members how to protect our, um, ourselves from. So I'm gonna, I always start with a quote and I'm gonna start today with a quote from Beyonce Knowles. She said, be healthy and take care of yourself, but be happy with the beautiful things that make you, you. So when you teach each of the sessions, we want you to look at the quote for motivation that's in your manual, and then talk about it with your community members about what that means. So it's important that we take care of ourselves. We, we try to be healthy, but we also have to recognize the beauty that's in us and that makes us who we are. You know, we're doing this manual and we're talking about the disparities that exist in the African-American community. And if you look at some of the other um, information that's out there, you know, growing up myself, it can be very hard and stressful um, in the African-American community because of some of the disparities that we're talking about and because of some of the um, barriers that we have in our community. But it's important to teach our community that, hey, it's important to be healthy and recognize the health disparities. But we also have to recognize that we're a wonderful people. <clears throat> Sorry. We come from individuals that have greatness and so, you know, although we're talking about disparities, just realizing that we are a wonderful people and we can overcome quite a bit if we stick together and know that there's beauty, beauty within us. So diabetes, did you know that having diabetes makes you more likely to get heart disease or have a heart attack? So that's right. You know, we usually think about, well, blood sugar, what does that have to do 
with our heart or diabetes. I usually hear that that's associated with amputations. Um, what does that have to do with our heart? Today, in today's session, we're going to learn about how diabetes affects our heart and increases our risk for heart disease. If you have diabetes, which we're going to talk about what that means in just a minute, or you know someone with diabetes, it's very important that they work with their healthcare provider. Or you work with your healthcare provider, a registered dietitian, um, a diabetes educator to help control and monitor your blood sugar. We're gonna learn that diabetes can have a great impact on the heart, but also on other organs as well. So it's very important to monitor your blood sugar, also called blood glucose, if you have diabetes. Now, diabetes is a very serious problem in the African-American community as well. Diabetes affects men, women, and unfortunately, over the past decades, it's also been affecting children as well. We usually don't think about children and diabetes except with type 1 diabetes, and I'm going to discuss the difference between the different types of diabetes. But because of the situation that our community is in, in terms of our diet, in terms of lack of exercise, in terms of other barriers that may exist, diabetes has become a problem with our children as well. So we have to realize that when we talk about diabetes, it's not just for the older individuals anymore. It's also something we have to consider with our children. About 13% of African-Americans have a diagnosis of diabetes. So 13% of African Americans, they have actually been diagnosed by a doctor with diabetes. But there are many others that have it, but they haven't been diagnosed with it yet. So just like hypertension, high blood pressure, which we talked about before, can be a silent killer because it sets you up for strokes and heart attacks. Or just like high cholesterol can be a silent killer because you don't feel it, but it's blocking your arteries. Diabetes can also be one of those silent killers in that you can have it, but haven't been diagnosed with it. So it's important that we educate our community on what diabetes is, that they talk to their healthcare provider so that they are screened for it, and that we then teach individuals to how to control diabetes if they have it. African Americans are also more likely to have diabetes and to die from it than white. So we have a lot of diabetes in our community, more so than the white population, but we're unaware of it. So because of that, we're more likely to die from some of the complications of diabetes. So awareness in our community is the key. Diabetes affects almost every part of your body. Now, diabetes, we're going to learn in a few minutes, what it does is it can cause your blood to be sluggish, to not flow as well. And blood flow to every organ is very important. If you don't have good blood flow to all of your organs, then of course it can lead to problems. Um, I believe I have told the group that I have sickle cell disease and just like sickle cell disease, diabetes can affect every organ because it affects the, our blood flow. So we have to really think about how we go about um, educating our community on diabetes and controlling for it. Diabetes can make you more likely to have heart disease and to have a heart attack or stroke. And managing your blood, pre um, blood sugar is very important um, so that we can make sure that we are not putting our community in a situation that they can um, have these um, problems. Now, what is diabetes? So diabetes, now, well, normally we'll eat foods, right? And those foods are made up of fat, which we learned about before um, with the triglycerides chapter, cholesterol. Those um, um, foods are also made up of protein. And then they're made up also of glucose. And so normally when you take food in, it's broken down into glucose, which is a type of sugar. Blood carries that sugar to all of our cells. And then this is where our body then takes that glucose and turns it into energy. For the sugar to get into the cells, it needs help from a hormone called insulin. Now, diabetes is when the body can't make enough insulin 
or when cells can't use the um, sugar properly. And then it starts building up in our, in our bloodstream. To diabetes, you can have a situation called prediabetes. And prediabetes is when the blood sugar levels are higher than normal, but it's not high enough yet to be diabetes. One in three people will have prediabetes. So it's important to not only help our community members understand the importance of diabetes, but also recognize prediabetes as well. Because people with prediabetes often go on to develop type 2 diabetes. So it's important to monitor in our community what are blood sugar levels. It's important to educate the community members on the importance of screening. And it's important to identify those risk factors such as prediabetes. And if you have individuals in your community that have prediabetes, so they don't have diabetes yet, and you may hear in conversations, you're talking to individuals and they'll say, well, my doctor hasn't di diagnosed me with diabetes, but are, do they have prediabetes? If they have prediabetes, then it's important to take those small steps, such as eating healthier foods and moving more, working out, getting exercise in, that can help improve their body's use of insulin. So as we said, diabetes is when the body can't use insulin property, properly taking those steps to help prevent or delay type 2 diabetes in people that have prediabetes. Now, normal blood sugar, prediabetes, and diabetes. So what are the numbers? Your normal blood sugar when you have a fasting glucose level, and a fasting glucose is when you don't eat anything within four hours or more before the test. Fasting glucose is, hey, I haven't eaten anything in four hours or more before I take the glucose test. You will, we'll, we will also talk about having tests done. Sometimes like you will have a health fair and the individual has been eating and they then have a um, blood glucose test. That's not fasting because they've been eating in that four hours prior. But fasting is when they haven't eaten anything within the four hours before they have the test. Normal levels will be 70 to 99 milligrams per deciliter. So if, you if you're less than 99 or if you're at 99, then you're good. You're in a normal range um, for your fasting glucose level. Pre-diabetes, which we also can call impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance, is when you have a fasting glucose level of 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter. So individuals that are screened and they have a fasting glucose level between 100 and 125, they don't have diabetes yet, but they're at risk of going on to develop diabetes in the future. So what we want to do is then have them take those steps. If you have a fasting glucose level that's more than 126 grams per deciliter, then you have a diagnosis of diabetes. And that is going to put you at risk for cardiovascular disease, as well as other complications that we're going to discuss later in this session. So it's important that we educate our community members on what normal blood sugar levels are, what prediabetes sugar levels are, what diabetes sugars level are. The importance of fasting plasma glucose level measurements versus having it done at a health fair. What's the difference? So that we can help individuals to live a healthier lifestyle. Now, we're talking about diabetes, and earlier I said, well, children aren't affected by it. But one important thing is to keep in mind that there are different types of diabetes as well. And there are three main types of diabetes. So as I mentioned, you have insulin that's made by your pancreas. Your pancreas makes insulin and puts the insulin out so that insulin can then help glucose get into your cells. Now, there is a situation in younger individuals, in children and young adults, where because of some autoimmune reaction, those cells in the pancreas that create insulin have been destroyed. And so now the individual doesn't have any of those cells that produce the insulin. So they then have what's called type 1 diabetes. 
Okay. Now, type one diabetes, it's due to some autoimmune reaction process. It's not due to um, your health habits. It usually occurs in younger individuals and that the, they make no insulin whatsoever. The pancreas doesn't make insulin. So because of that, of course, they have to inject insulin into their body every day. Now, type 2 diabetes, and this is the diabetes that we're going to discuss mainly in this chapter, it usually happens later on in life, usually at age 45. But as I've mentioned earlier, we're starting to see it at younger ages in our community, even in children, because of our health, style, of our health habits, because of the way we live. And so that type 2 diabetes is when your body makes some insulin, but it either make, doesn't make enough insulin or the insulin that it makes isn't good enough to really help your body get all of the sugar into the cells. And because of that, blood sugar builds up, right? If, if, if you have blood sugar going through your arteries, your veins, um, that usually insulin helps your body move the sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cells where it can be used. But because there is not enough insulin or because the insulin is not functioning as well, you then have what's called type 2, type 2 diabetes. Now, with type 1 diabetes, they don't make any insulin. Because they don't make any insulin, they have to inject insulin every day into their body. With type 2 diabetes, you're making insulin but you may not be making enough. Because of that, you may have to in, um, inject yourself with insulin or you may take other medications that help your body to use the insulin more efficiently or that the, it causes your pancreas to increase cells. So individuals with type two diabetes, they may not have to inject themselves with insulin. They may or they may not. But they may have to take medications, though, that help their body to use insulin more efficiently. Now, the third type of diabetes, we've covered type 1 diabetes, we've covered type 2 diabetes, and I said that there are three types of diabetes. The third type is what's called gestational diabetes. And as the name says, gestational means it only occurs in pregnant women. Pregnant women could have high glucose levels. They have diabetes because it's above the 126 milligrams per deciliter while they're pregnant. But then after the baby is born, the diabetes goes away. So diabetes that only occurs in pregnant women during that time when they're pregnant, that's gestational diabetes. Now it goes away after the baby is born, but they are still at risk. Those women that had gestational diabetes are still at risk of de developing diabetes later in life. So they need to be very aware that the risk factors are higher. They need to take those steps then that help them to pre prevent them from moving on to type two diabetes or that control the complications of diabetes. Women who are older than 25 years of age are overweight or have a family history of type di two diabetes are at greater risk of having gestational diabetes. So if you know a woman, she's pregnant and she's older than 25, or she's overweight, or she has a family history of type two diabetes, then you need to educate them that, hey, you are at greater risk of having gestational diabetes. African-American women are also more likely to have gestational diabetes than white women. And also, Individuals with polycystic ovary syndrome are also at greater risk of developing type 2 um, gestational diabetes. We also have to keep in mind that not only is the mother at risk because she had gestational diabetes, but her child is also at risk. So children who are born to women that have had gestational diabetes are at a greater risk also of becoming overweight and then also developing diabetes later in life. Now, once we have an individual that has type two diabetes, we then have to work with them on how to control that diabetes, how to say, okay, you have a type two diabetes diagnosis. It's very important that you control for type two diabetes 
because having type 2 diabetes puts you at risk for cardiovascular disease and other complications that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Now, what are some of those steps that we can help individuals that have type 2 diabetes to live a healthier lifestyle? Well, we want them to eat smaller portions, you know, take on habits that say, okay, I need to eat less because I have type 2 diabetes. So I want to eat smaller portions. I mean, maybe you can do tricks like having smaller plates or so forth. You want to drink water and avoid um, other um, soft drinks, avoid sodas, avoid the iced tea. And we're going to talk about that later. But we know down in the South, when we go to Bojangles and we get our tea, it's very sweet. We want to avoid those sweetened drinks and drink more water and unsweetened drinks. We want to eat less high carbohydrate foods, and that can include baked goods. It can include rice, pastas, and potatoes. So we usually don't think of those as foods high in sugar, but we need to educate our community that yes, rice, pasta, and potatoes are high in carbohydrates, and those carbohydrates are um, changed to sugar in our body. We need to educate members that they need to do at least two and a half hours of moderate intensity exercise per week. You know, it can be something as simple as walking around the neighborhood or doing exercise in your community that help you to stay healthy and then help you to control di diabetes risk factors. And we need to have individuals that have been identified with diabetes or pre-diabetes to work with their healthcare providers on what they can do to not only control their diabetes, but also monitor, um, take those um, steps to control their diet and other um, actions that can help them to live a healthier lifestyle. Now the risk factors for type two diabetes, and I have them listed here, and we've talked about a few of them previously. We've talked about pre-diabetes. If you have pre-diabetes, that puts you at risk for developing <coughs> type two diabetes later. We've also talked about women that have had gestational diabetes, they are at an increased risk as well. Other risk factors for diabetes include age, include a family history of diabetes, and include being African American, Hispanic, Latino American, or these other minority groups. So those are factors we cannot control. We can't control age. You know, unfortunately, I wish I could be 25 again, but that's not gonna happen. I can't control, hey, I'm African-American. That's another risk factor I can't control. Now I'll tell you a story, diabetes is in my family. My mother had diabetes, my brother has diabetes, my grandmother has diabetes. So I have a significant family history of diabetes. I can't control that. So those are things that I can't control. And in addition to that, gestational diabetes, and polycystic ovary, ovary syndrome, I, you wouldn't be able to control that either. But some of the things you can control includes having prediabetes. I, I know that you're thinking, well, if they have prediabetes, how you can you control for that? You can take healthier lifestyle um, habits early on in life to help getting to prediabetes. But if you have prediabetes, that's a risk factor. You can control being um, having high blood pressure. So we've talked about high blood pressure in the previous session. We've talked about some of those things such as exercise, uh, watching how much salt we take in. That's something I can control with my diabetes. So having high blood pressure is a um, risk factor for diabetes and it's something that I can control. Being overweight or obese, that's something I can control for. I, I can take, make sure that I eat less foods, make sure that I exercise more to control my weight. Now having depression, yeah, if you, you, if you have major depression, of course, that's something that you can say, hey, I can't control. But you can take steps um, if you don't have major depression to control your depression. Or you can, even if you have major depression, you can take steps to control depression. So that's another risk factor. Depression is another risk factor for diabetes. And then of course, physical inactivity sitting around on the couch. I know I'm guilty of this. It puts me at risk of being overweight. 
It puts me at risk of diabetes. It puts me at high um, risk of high blood pressure. So those are risk factors that we need to work with our community members and say, how do we begin to help our community members take healthier habits so that they can know their grandchildren? Now, we've talked about some of the risk factors for diabetes. Now I'm gonna discuss some of the symptoms that you may have for of diabetes. So, you know, we think about, okay, as I mentioned earlier, it can be a silent killer, right? I can have diabetes and not be aware of it. But fortunately, there are warning signs that my body starts saying that will help me to know, hey, I may be at risk of diabetes. There may be something going on that's not right. And you wanna teach your community members about these symptoms so that they are aware of them when they talk to their doctor. And one of the symptoms, of course, is, you know, having to use the bathroom to pee, to urinate often at night. So, you know, you're usually at nighttime, you know, an individual is able to sleep through the night. They may start noticing that, well, you know, hey, doctor, I have to get up one or two times during the night to use the bathroom. That could be a warning sign that, hey, something is wrong and, and, and they're at risk for diabetes. So if you have someone in your um, in your community, they're starting to have signs of more frequent urination, and particularly it's starting to wake them up at night. That could be a warning sign of diabetes. Having dry skin, that could be another warning sign that someone um, is, is, has diabetes. That could be another symptom of diabetes. Feeling very thirsty. So you might have an individual like, oh, I just, I drink a lot of water, but I still am very thirsty. That could be a symptom of diabetes, and we need to educate our community members about that. Feeling very tired or fatigued. That's another warning sign. Losing weight without trying. So that might be something that, hey, we might think the opposite, right? You know, um, diabetes is associated with being overweight. If I'm losing weight, then, you know, hey, is that, well, if you're not trying to lose weight, but you're still losing weight, then that could be a symptom of diabetes, and you need to Make sure you educate your community members about that. Having sores that don't heal or heal slowly, feeling very hungry, having blurred vision. Now, I, I'll tell you that my brother, as I mentioned, he has diabetes. And he said his first warning sign was that his vision was just off. And particularly at night, when he'd be driving at nighttime, it seemed like the lights just weren't right, that, that something was off with the light. Um, when he would drive at night, he said that that was his first symptom of diabetes, that he noticed that he started having more blurry vision. And because of that symptom, he went to his doctor and talked about it, and then they diagnosed him with diabetes. So having blurred symptom, um, vision is another symptom of diabetes. Having more infections than usual, and also feeling numbness or tingling in your hands or feet. So we want to educate our community members, we want, and we want to be aware ourselves that these are symptoms, these are the things that are telling your body, hey, something is wrong, that you need to follow up with your health care provider, get tested to make sure you don't have diabetes. Now, most of these symptoms, all of these symptoms can be a sign of something else, but they can also be a warning sign for diabetes. Now, um, in your manual, you're gonna have a demonstration. We talked about what diabetes is. And we said that, well, diabetes is you have excess blood, sugar in your blood. And one of the things that's really unique about the manual, I, I think in my opinion, is that it has a lot of demonstrations for community members. And it makes it real for community members because some of these things can be hard to understand. You know, when we're talking about the inside of the body, if they don't have a background in medicine, so one of them that's in your manual is like, okay, so help your community members vision. How is diabetes infect, affecting my organs? And, you know, earlier I created this bottle of um, water that I added some red dye to, and it's just water here. You can see how it flows real easily, you know, through the tube, right? The water moves through the tube very easily. If you have diabetes, then what's happened is that blood is now staying in your blood. 
um, um, sugar is staying in your blood. And what that does is it makes your blood thicker and harder to move through the cells. So you think about your heart and in the very first session, we learned that your heart has to beat strong every second of every day to pump blood around your body. And if it's really loose, if it's really easy, if it flows real easy, then it's easier for your heart to pump that blood through the body. Now, if you have a lot of sugar in your blood, unfortunately, it's going to be harder. So it's going to put a harder strain on your heart. It's going to put more strain on your heart to pump that blood. That's one of the ways that diabetes affects the heart. It makes it harder for it to push the blood through your body. It does other things as well, because now you're down at your, art, um, at your feet, you're down at your toes, you have this blood that's not circulating as well. It makes it harder for that blood to flow and get into your cell. So what we want to do is we want to use these demonstrations. And I know that it's harder for you to see here um, over the computer. Um, what I'm talking about, you know, you can't see that that one, this it flows slower than with the um, one that doesn't have the sugar in it. Two, another thing, I wish I was there with you because it's also heavier, right? Um, it's also heavier. And, and so that makes, that's a lot of strain on your heart. So you wanna make sure that you're saying this, you're doing this to your community members um, so that they, they can understand and it makes it real to them. I did get a question in the chat. Some people say foods and beverages labeled sugar-free or sugar substitute raise their blood glucose levels, should sugar substitutes be avoided? Now, that is a very interesting question. And um, I'm going to talk about my um, understanding of sugar substitutes. I don't know if we have a dietitian here that can add to what I'm about to say. So sugar substitutes, what they are, um, they can be of different types. There are some sugar substitutes. As I mentioned, what, what your body does is it breaks down food into fat, into protein, and into glucose. And then it absorbs that glucose. Now, glucose is a type of sugar. There are other types of sugar as well. Some of them are complex sugars. So when you say carbohydrates, glucose, glucose is a type of carbohydrates, but there are other carbohydrates such as fructose, such as galactose, such as compound sugars, where there's two, a glucose and a galactose together. And then there are other sugars, which are in these, some of these sugar substitutes that look like sugar, but they have something that's different, all right? So a sugar is a five carbon little element and you have oxygens and carbons coming off of them. And if you were to move some of those oxygens from one of the carbons to a different one, it's still a sugar, but it's different. And your body recognizes how to get some of the sugars into your body, but there are other sugars that are slightly different that your body can't take it in. Your body can't absorb it because it's not the carbohydrate it's used to dealing with. Because of that, your body doesn't absorb those sugars. So it's, it, it's a sweetener. You're going to taste it on your tongue, but your body's not going to absorb it. There are other sweeteners that are they're just sweeter but they don't do as much in your body they're harder to break down and in a few minutes we'll talk about food labels and I'm going to want you to notice when we do talk about food labels that under carbohydrates you're going to see that you have sugars but you also have fiber so some of those sweeteners they might be a little sweeter so you don't need to use as much sugar now your question about should you avoid them um, I would say that, you know, of course it becomes an individual choice. I, I, you know, I talk to my wife sometimes and, oh, you know, back in the eighties, you know, I, I don't know if you, you all would remember that there was controversy about, oh, sweet and low, does it cause cancer or does it do these other things or so on and so forth. And, you know, I, as a doctor, I, I can never say something doesn't do something. But what I would say is that, that the research has been done. These sweeteners don't cause cancer. They can be healthy for you. And what you need to do is balance, okay, you know, I have diabetes. I can take in the sugar, which can make my life a lot worse because it can make the diabetes worse. Or I can take something that has a sweetener 
and that could help me to control for my diabetes. Now, personally, I do drink sweet. Um, I, I drink a lot of Coke Zero, which has Splenda in it. And from my understanding, Splenda doesn't have any of the risk factors. It doesn't cause cancer, which you might've heard. So I would say that taking those sweeteners can be beneficial for you. But of course, you, you want to look at, you know, what are the risk factors of taking too much sweeteners, of course? What are some of the risk factors for taking in sugar and then balancing those things out in communication with your doctor? Now, we mentioned earlier about getting tested for diabetes, about screening for diabetes. And as I mentioned earlier, when you screen for diabetes, you can do what's called a fasting plasma glucose test. And that's done when you don't have any food, you don't have any sugar prior to getting the test done. Now here they say at least eight hours before the test. And that's, you usually will talk to your doctor and they'll say, well, don't eat anything, come in early in the morning and then we'll do the test. You know, before you've had your breakfast, before you do anything like that. Usually four to eight hours for a fasting glucose level, definitely more than four hours. So if you had something in the four hours prior, it's no longer a fasting blood glucose. But you can also do a random plasma glucose test. So that's when you have had something in the prior four hours um, or the four to eight hours. You will usually see fasting blood glucose plasmas done at health fairs. So an individual wasn't told the night before to not eat. They're just out. You're doing a health fair in your community. And you say, hey, we want to test blood sugar. And that's where they would do it, even though you've eaten your breakfast already that morning. But that still can give you an indication of whether you're at risk of diabetes. So an individual that has a random plasma glucose level greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter, they may have diabetes. So they need to follow up with their healthcare providers. This is very important because we're going to want to do health screenings in our community. And if you're out, you do a health screening in your community and you have an individual whose blood glucose level is greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter, of course, chances are it's not a fasting because they've eaten that morning, but you would want to make sure you get them referred quickly to a healthcare provider so that they can follow up, so that they can do the fasting blood glucose level test, so that they can do other tests to diagnose them for diabetes if they're at risk of it. Now, we, we mentioned the important numbers to know here, you know, uh, um, greater than 99. So if you're less than 99 milligrams per deciliter, that's normal. But 100 to 125 is pre-diabetes. And then greater than 126, of course, is diabetes. Okay, now individuals are diagnosed with diabetes. They are then put on um, medications that may help them to control their diabetes. Of course, that medication is going to help them to move sugar out of their bloodstream and into the cells. So what is that going to do? That's going to lower their blood sugar, right? If you have individuals that are taking medications for diabetes, they're doing other things, they can put themselves at risk for hypoglycemia. Now, we learned that, high, um, that diabetes is sh blood sugar levels of 126 or greater. We learned that prediabetes is 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter. And average, the normal is that 99 milligrams per deciliter. But if you have an individual with diabetes, they're taking medications that lower their blood sugars, they have to be very aware that they don't lower their blood sugar too much. If they lower their blood sugar too much, that's called hypoglycemia. They don't have enough blood sugar in their blood. Now, for most people, this level is 70 milligrams per deciliter or less. And hypoglycemia can happen with people with or even people without diabetes. So you don't have to have diabetes to end up with hypoglycemia. But you want to monitor for that because that can be a risk factor in individuals with diabetes, particularly since they are taking medications that lower their blood pressure, um, lower their blood sugar. Now, I'll tell you a personal story here. Um, as I mentioned, my mother 
had diabetes. And you can hear us say had diabetes. We believe that she died from hypoglycemia. She was taking medications to control her diabetes. She probably didn't monitor it correctly and she let her blood sugar get too low. As a result of that, she fell into a coma and then she passed away of, um, about seven days after she fell into that coma. That's a personal story. And I would encourage you, if you're willing to share personal stories so that it becomes real to your community members. Um, fortunately, my, grand, my mother was able to live long enough to know some of her grandchildren. Um, you know, we, we wish she could have known them more but because of circumstances, but these are the circumstances that we want to make sure we're controlling in our community. And teaching about hypoglycemia is a very important part of diabetes education. So if you know someone that has diabetes, they're taking medications for diabetes, it's very important that you work with them, that they work with their healthcare providers to make sure that their blood sugars don't get too low. Now, some of the symptoms and the treatments for hypoglycemia, you can get hypoglycemia if you're not eating enough carbs. So as I mentioned, if you're taking in um, the um, um, diabetes medication, if you're having to inject yourself with insulin and you're not eating enough, that can put you at risk for hypoglycemia. If you're skipping or delaying meals, and I think that this may have been the situation for my mother where she's still taking her diabetes med medication, but she might have been skipping meals, that can put you at risk for hypoglycemia. So if you know someone with diabetes, it's very important that you tell them they need to eat regularly and not skip meals. If you're taking diabetes medication, you're taking insulin, and then you start an exercise regimen. Now we want people to exercise, but if they have diabetes, it's very important that they talk to their doctor because if they start an exercise regimen, um, they're taking diabetes medication, and they're not aware they can cause hypoglycemia because the physical increased physical activity is causing their body to use the sugar up now and that can drop their blood sugar. So we want to make sure that they're aware of that. If they're drinking too much alcohol without eating food. So that can happen sometimes. You say, well, hey, you know, the blood sugar, you know, that's from the um, pastries I'm eating, from the, it's from the um, breads that I'm eating. I'm going to cut down on breads, but hey, I'm going to have a shot of alcohol. That can put you at risk for hypoglycemia. So we need to educate our community about that. And then also when you're sick, your body uses more energy to fight infections, to deal with sickness. So if, if you know an individual, they have diabetes and they get become sick, it's important that you educate them about hype, the risk of hypoglycemia. Now, some of the symptoms that could let you know that, hey, someone may be suffering from hypoglycemia include shakiness or jittery, um, includes they're, they're becoming more sweaty, may have headaches, they feel sleepy or tired, dizziness or lightheaded, or confusion or disoriented. Those can be signs that, hey, they are having symptoms of hypoglycemia. We need to get them help quickly. What do we mean by getting them help? Well, if you know someone, they have diabetes, they're taking medications and they're having these symptoms, it may be that their sugar levels are too low. So to get their blood sugar levels back up to normal, we want them to quickly eat or drink about 15 grams of carbohydrates. This can be done by having glucose tablets or glucose gels. You can have half a cup of fruit juice. So you can give them a half a cup of orange juice to drink. You can also give them uh, half a can of soda. Um, they can also have a tablespoon of sugar or honey or corn syrup of some type, or also two tablespoons of raisins. So individuals that have diabetes, they're taking medications for it. We want to make them aware of the symptoms of hypoglycemia. And if they get into a situation where they're having symptoms or their blood sugar is too low, we want them to take these um, items here, the glucose tablets, fruit juice, soda, um, sugar, um, or even eating raisins. If individuals have diabetes, they're taking medications for it, they're working with their doctor, and they may be traveling, they may go somewhere, um, 
what we want to do is educate them about keeping some of these rescue foods on them to have handy so that if they get in trouble with hypoglycemia, they can take these. And so maybe keeping a small carton of raisins in their purse or maybe keeping glucose tablets or um, a can of soda with them just in case. And, and as I said, you know, I shared that personal story that we believe that it was hypoglycemia that, that was the reason that my mother um, fell into a coma um, and passed away. Now, of course, we learned about hypoglycemia can be a risk, but in individuals with di diabetes, we also want to worry about hyperglycemia. Now, hyperglycemia is when the blood sugar gets too high. It's much higher than normal. We learned that diabetes is greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter. But when it gets way up to like 180 milligrams per deciliter, 200 milligrams per deciliter, you know, higher than that, that individual is at risk for hyperglycemia. And people with diabetes can get hyperglycemia by not eating the right foods. Of course, you know, you have diabetes and you're eating sugar buns for, for breakfast. You're eating a lot of bread and sugars for lunch. You, you have dinner that has a lot of carbohydrates. That's gonna put you at risk of hyperglycemia. If you're not taking your medications properly, and this is what happens unfortunately in our community. Individuals have been diagnosed with diabetes for some reason, and, and I'm gonna say reasons because it could be that you know, unfortunately, they can't afford their medication or they don't know how to take their medications properly, but something's happening where they're skipping their medications or they're not taking it, taking it properly. That can put them at risk of hyperglycemia, having an infection. So as I said earlier, your body has to fight the infection. It does a lot of different things. It can put you at risk for hypoglycemia, but it can also put you at risk of hyperglycemia. Uh, taking certain medications, there are some medications that cause our body to release more sugar. Like if you're taking a cortisol, and cortisol is gonna say, hey, I'm gonna release a lot of sugar. As I mentioned earlier, you know, stress is a um, risk factor for diabetes because it causes your body to release more sugar. That can also put you at risk of hyperglycemia. If you're having hormonal problems, we talked about polycystic ovary, ovary syndrome, but there can be other hormonal problems that are going on. Those can put you at risk of hyperglycemia. And of course, as I mentioned, being very sick. The early symptoms of that, you know, I talked about if you have a high blood sugar, if you have diabetes, well, frequent urination is a symptom of diabetes. It can also be a symptom of hyperglycemia. Feeling more thirsty or tired than, um, than normal. So now you feel like, hey, I've drank water and I'm, I, just, I, I just can't, you know, quench my thirst. That could be a sign not only of diabetes, but also of hyperglycemia. The blurred vision, as I mentioned to the group, my brother, he said his first symptom of diabetes was that he had blurred vision. That can be a symptom of diabetes, um, hyperglycemia, and then also headaches. Now, what we want to do is we want to protect our community members from letting those symptoms get too far, letting get them get into late symptoms. And some of those late symptoms of hyperglycemia can include fruity smelling breath, it can include nausea and vomiting, shortness of breath, dry mouth, weakness, confusion, <coughs> stomach pains, and then it can lead to coma. So we want to make sure that we're educating our community members that, hey, <coughs> these are the symptoms of hyperglycemia, and then this is what it can lead to, and we want to protect them from the significant risk. So if they are at risk of hyperglycemia or they're having some of these symptoms, it's important that they talk to their healthcare providers, talk to their doctors. We need you to work with our community members to educate them about this so that they can keep themselves from um, severe complications. Now, the complications of diabetes. You know, if you have diabetes and it goes on uncontrolled, let's say my brother would have hey, I'm having the blurred visions, but it's not a problem. I can deal with it. I'm going to just keep doing what I'm doing. Over time, that diabetes that's uncontrolled can lead to damage to blood vessels and nerves, including the nerves that control your heart. So the longer you let your diabetes go uncontrolled, the longer you have elevated blood sugars, 
then, and um, then the greater your chances of developing significant complications. And these complications can include heart disease and heart attack. So I talked to you just a minute ago about, hey, if, if you have a lot of sugar in your blood, it's heavier. It's harder to flow through the body, right? So that's going to put more strain on your heart. So heart disease and a heart attack is a complication of diabetes. That blood has to flow to your brain. Well, if you're not having it flow properly into your brain, that can lead to stroke. Um, you know, blood has to flow into your kidneys and your kidneys has to filter all of the sugar and, and, and it has to filter other things out. And it's if it's having to fill out, filter out sugar, a lot of sugar that can put you at risk of kidney disease. So diabetes can lead to kidney disease. As I mentioned, eye disease. So my brother had blurred vision. That's because the diabetes was having an impact on his eyes, on his vision. So that's something we want to control for. One of the significant complications that you may hear about with diabetes is amputation. And, you know, you hear a lot about, well, an individual had to lose their leg, lose their foot. We want to protect from that. You may know of individuals that because of complications from diabetes, they have lost the foot, they have lost the leg. And we want to make sure that we're working with our community members to avoid these complications. Individuals can also have problems with digestion, bladder control, and sexual dysfunction. So, you know, that might be the one symptom that a, um, one of your community members present with. They may say, you know, I, I just can't do my nature like I used to. I can't, you know, be with my spouse, my wife, like I used to. What's going on? That could be a symptom of diabetes. So if you or someone that you're close to has diabetes, it's very important that they talk to their healthcare provider, that you talk to your healthcare provider if you have any symptoms to prevent or control the complications of diabetes. Now, next we're going to talk about the ABCs of diabetes. And this is in your handout on 7.34. Um, I'm not going to go to it right now, but it's important that you use the handouts in your community, talk to your community members about those handouts because these are things that they can take with them. And it's important to talk to them about the ABCs of diabetes. So if you have diabetes, if you know community members that have diabetes, we want to use the ABCs to lower their risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. And what are the ABCs? So A stands for A1C blood test. Now, earlier we talked about the other two types of blood tests for blood sugar. We talked about fasting blood glucose. That's when an individual doesn't eat for four to eight hours before they have the test and what your, your blood sugars are there. We also talked about random blood sugar tests. So that's where you're gonna have a health fair you know, an individual just walks up. They probably had their breakfast, breakfast that, that morning, but they didn't fast. And then that might give an indication for diabetes. Another blood test, and this is only done in individuals that have been diagnosed with diabetes, but it's called an A1C blood test. And what an A1C blood test does is it measures how well the blood has, sugar has been controlled over the last three months. So that one, they, we want to teach community members that, hey, A1C, that's an indication of how well you control your diabetes, your blood sugar over the last three months. It's different than a random or a fasting blood glucose level. It gives us a picture of over a longer time span. Now, when I was um, practicing medicine, you know, we would have individuals with diabetes come in and what they would do is after, you know, they want some approval. So they'll say, well, I have an appointment with my doctor uh, this week, so I'm going to eat less sugar so that my blood sugar goes down before my appointment. But then we'll talk to them and say, hey, how has your blood sugar been controlled? They'll say, oh, it's been doing well. We do the fasting blood glucose and, oh, it looks good. But then we do the A1C and it's high. It's elevated. And that shows us that over the past three months, they haven't been doing a good job of controlling their blood sugar. So we need to work with this. In the ABCs, B stands for blood pressure. So we mentioned how, hey, we, if you have elevated blood sugar, it's harder for your um, body to push the blood. It's harder for your heart to push the blood through your body. You want to control for blood pressure. So if you have high blood pressure, you have to work hard to get that under control. 
C is for the cholesterol. So if you have diabetes, you're putting yourself at risk by having high cholesterol as well, because you're putting an, adding another factor of blood flow here. So not only is your blood thicker because it has more sugar in it, it's also trying now to flow through arteries that are clogged. So we wanna make sure that we're teaching individuals that have diabetes to control the cholesterol levels as well. And then S is to stop smoking, stop smoking. We know that smoking does a lot of bad things to us. It causes our body to increase LDL cholesterol, which is bad for us. There's no healthy way to smoke. There's no healthy measurement of smoke. One cigarette a day is still not good for us. So we want to help our community members to not smoke. Now, other tips to help us to control our blood sugar. We have to keep in mind that sugar is high in calories and contributes to weight gain, right? So not only does eating that honey bun in the morning, you know, increase my blood sugar and that puts me at risk, but it also increases me at, puts me at risk for obesity because sugars are high in calories. So it can lead to being overweight, right? We need to watch how much sugar we're taking in. Carbohydrates, as I mentioned before, when I talked about sweeteners, they can be in baked food, um, goods, rice, cereals, potatoes. They have different types of carbohydrates, but they still have carbohydrates. So even though you look at that potato and you say, well, a potato has sugar in it. Yes, it has a carbohydrate in it that's going to be broken down into sugar. Also pastas and sweet beverages. So we want to make sure that we're teaching our communities that these carbohydrates are going to be broken down into sugar, and then that can affect our blood sugar levels as well. We also have to keep in mind that manufacturers, they also add other types of sweeteners. So one that's very common, particularly in the American society, is what's called high fructose corn syrup. It's in almost everything as a sweetener. Now, there are sweeteners that, you know, we discussed in the pre previous questions that can help you lose weight, but there are other sweeteners, for example, the high fructose corn syrup that are bad for you. Your body's going to absorb that and it's going to turn it into sugar. You also have other sweeteners such as honey that can be turned to sugar. So someone might say, oh, honey with my tea instead of sugar, that's still going to be changed to glucose in your body. So be aware of that. Foods you wouldn't expect to have a lot of sugar. So you might say, well, you know, hey, I'm going to eat my breakfast. I'm going to have oatmeal, but I'm going to add fruit and maple um, to it. I'm going to have fruit and maple oatmeal. That can have as much sugar as a can of soda. Another thing that you really wouldn't think about has sugar is barbecue sauce, right? You're going to go to that cookout. You know, they're putting barbecue sauce on the chicken. You're like, well, I'm not going to eat a lot of sugar today. I'm just going to have some barbecue chicken. Well, it's high in sugar because they added that barbecue sauce and the barbecue sauce has sugar in it. Now, one of the things that we really want to keep in mind here, we don't want to make our community members feel bad. This isn't about them stopping cold turkey, eating the foods they like to enjoy. What we want to do is teach them how to balance, how to balance. So help bring them to recognize if I do something, I need to balance it out. If I eat a lot of sugar in the morning because I'm eating a bowl of cereal or I'm eating a honey bun or I'm having my cup of coffee in the morning that has sugar with the sweetener, then I need to think about how I balance it out through the day by eating sugars later on, less sugar later on in the day. So it's, it's not about trying to be perfect. We're not trying to get to our community members, oh, you cannot have that iced tea from Bojangles. We, we want to discourage it. But we need to help individuals live a healthier lifestyle. And that also includes helping them to make compromise and helping them to balance things out. Now, we're going to move now to how do they do that? You know, the goal here is to teach community members to balance it out, to teach community members that you can still avoid, um, um, have some of the foods you like, but you need to be aware. Awareness is key here. That that's what we want to teach our community members awareness. And how do they get that awareness? Well, one of the things we want to do is teach them how to read food labels. In our previous sessions, when we talked about um, salt and salt intake, we talked about food labels. 
and how to use those food labels to help our community members make healthier choices. We're back on food labels again, you know, and it's a very important that you teach your community members how to read the food labels to make healthier choices. So when we look at the food labels, and this is a food label for a can of soda, we want to first have them look at, well, what are the serving size and serving numbers, right? Your serving size is going to be the amount in that particular container, right? This can of soda has one serving size, right? And then the number of servings is in this can. One um, serving size is 12 ounces. The number of serving in this can is one. So this is one 12 ounce can of soda. Now, you know, I, I went out looking. I, as I said, I have this demonstration here that I'm going to talk about in just a minute. And it was very hard to find a can of soda, right? We rarely take a can of soda these days. Now, you know, you might go out, you know, because I, I do have soda cans when I buy them in the larger containers. But what do we usually do? We usually go out and we get a 16 ounce bottle of soda. Now, we just learned here a serving size is one can. If I take a 16 ounce bottle of soda, well, now I'm having more than one serving. If I go to 7 Eleven and I get a big gulp, well, now I'm having one more than one serving. So we have to teach our community members that, hey, you're no longer at 160 calories. You're now more. You now have, you know, 200 calories. If you do the big golf, it might be 300 calories or 400 calories. So we have to teach our community members a serving size is one ounce. That 16 ounces is more. That 20 ounces is more. You know, you're, you have to, so you have more in there. We next look at amounts per serving. So if, as I mentioned, you know, you want to teach them about amount per serving. And then we look at here. So this one amount per serving, it has 160 calories per serving. If I have a, then that's per 12 ounce, 16 ounces is going to be more, 20 ounces is going to be more. You know, if you've got 24 ounces, you're doubling this. So you're at 300 and um, 320 calories or so. So we want to teach our community members about that. You next want to move to your percent daily value. And in previous sessions, I, I know I have to move on because I want to give the other group a chance to present. We talked about percent um, per um, percent daily value. And we said, what you want to do here is you want to keep this number as much as possible to less than 5%. Why do you want to do that? This is how you want to think about percent per serving, right? So I have a, a balance. I have a budget of 100%, right? $100. I'm going to use now $14 on this one can of soda, right? So that leaves me with $86 left to spend for the rest of the day. So I want to think about, do I really want to spend that much on this soda? You, you might say, yeah, okay, well, you know. But what is important then is that I'm going to balance it out. If I spent um, um, if I spent 14% here, that means later on I have to spend less. Now, what becomes key in this can of soda, as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to bring your attention to carbohydrates here, right? It mentions carbohydrates and then it has sugar. Now, it might have 14% of your carbohydrates because you can have carbohydrates as fiber, you can have carbohydrates as other types of sugar. But it's 74% of my percent daily value in sugar. That means I, after I eat this, I only have 26% more sugar I can eat in that day. So if I have a soda and a honey bun for breakfast, I'm well over my 100% for the day, right? I'm well over. So we want to teach our community members how to look at that percent daily value and how where possible, choose foods that are less than 5% or around 5%. Avoid foods that are greater than 20%. And then the last thing you have here, we looked at calories earlier and then the amount of carbohydrates. This can of soda has 37 grams of sugar. Now, when you do your activity out in the community, there is an activity I'm going to want you to do in your community. Um, it's going to be guess the amount of sugar. And when you do it, what I would encourage you to do is go out and buy sugar cubes. So you can buy those, those square sugar cubes, have at your community. And then what you would want to do is 
you want to give them samples of drinks, and I'm going to have that in just a few minutes, and have them guess how many sugar cubes are in each of those drinks. Now, this can of soda, you know, I, I, I had sugar cubes. I don't know what I did with that. I misplaced it, so I wasn't able to do it. But I have a soda here, and we're talking about a can. So this is more than the can. And if I had the sugar cubes here, I would have 10 sugar cubes in front of me, right? And you would look at it and you say, wow, that's a lot of sugar for this one can of soda. So we want to teach our community members to start thinking about this in tangible ways. This one can of soda has 10 sugar cubes, which is a lot of sugar, and teach them how to make better choices. Now I'm going to now switch to a handout that's in your manuals um, that I want you to use when doing the training out in your community. Okay, give me just one second to share my screen and go here. And then when you're out in your community, now I'm moving a little faster because when you teach the manual out in the community, I encourage you to be more interactive than I can be. You know, I'm teaching it over Zoom. Uh, there's only so much I can do with interaction right now because of the way I have my Zoom set up. I can't see everybody. I can't ask people to read certain things or call on people to answer certain questions. But when you teach it out in your community, I encourage you to do that. Make it interactive. Make it interesting to your community members. You know, make it so that they want to learn this information. So this is in your manual. This is the handout on page um, um, 7.36. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a food label activity. So you have a choice here of choosing grape juice um, for um, your drink or choosing unsweetened iced tea. Now, you might think about it and say, oh, well, grape juice, that's good for me. I can get that. Or should you have the unsweetened iced tea? Now, if we look at our food labels, now this container that this um, grape juice is in, I imagine it's a larger container because this particular container has eight servings of grape juice in it, but a serving is, is one cup. So if we did one cup of grape juice against one cup of iced tea, uh, unsweetened tea, you know, it would both be a cup, but this container has a lot more than that. The grape juice has 150 calories in it, whereas the unsweetened tea has zero calories. So what's our better choice? To go with the zero, because it has zero calories and it has zero sugar in it. Now it's unsweetened iced tea. I've never drank tea with no sugar at all or no sugar substitute. If you use a sugar substitute, such as Sweet and Low, such as Splenda, such as Stevia, then that can also give you the zero calories. So what we wanna do is teach our community members to read the food labels. This grape juice though, one serving, so one cup of it has 35 grams of sugar. 35 grams of sugar. So it's important to help our community members understand that. Now, I want you to do these handouts with your community members when you teach it out in the community. We're gonna help Pam make better food choices. Pam is thinking about what to eat in the morning and she can either do some cooked oatmeal or she can do a toaster pastry. Now, if we look at the toaster pastry, a serving size is one pastry. So one of the pastries that she has is a serving size. Whereas the, with the oatmeal, it's half a cup, right? Half a cup. Pam probably won't eat the half a cup. She'll probably go with the whole cup. So she's going to have to multiply everything in this, in this table by two if she doubles how much she's eating. With the pastry, she's going to have 210 calories, right? 210 calories, whereas with the oatmeal, she'll only have 70. But where we want her to look also, this pastry has 14% of her percent daily value. If she eats this one pastry, that means for the whole day, she only has 86% left. Her budget is now spent. She only has 86%. Whereas if she ate the oatmeal, she now has 95% left. So here we would choose the oatmeal. We have sweetened applesauce versus unsweetened applesauce. Now, one might say, well, hey, they're both made from apples. What happens here though? 
with the sweetened applesauce, they're going to add sugar, includes added sugar. And it includes 12% of the percent daily value in added sugar. So we want to make sure that we're teaching our community members, hey, just because it's apple, people add items to it. You know, there are tricks that you can do. Um, you know, when you think about that added sugar, say someone's going to have peaches, and I don't know if that's one of the ones here. Um, just let's say they're going to have um, peaches in sauce versus peaches in water. What they want to do <coughs> is choose the peaches in water because that peaches in the sauce, it's added sugar. It's added carbohydrates. The sure, the peaches are healthy, but it's in syrup, and that's where the extra sugar is that we want to avoid. So we want to see here with the unsweetened applesauce, even though it's applesauce just like over here, they have added sweeteners to this applesauce. I'm going to do one more, and of course, we talked about this earlier um, with the tea. We want to try to choose as much as possible the unsweetened tea. So here you can still have your tea from Bojangles, but when you go in, ask them for the unsweetened iced tea from Bojangles, not the sweetened tea. Now, I told you that I was gonna move to an activity. And so here, uh, we're gonna do this activity with guess the sugar. Now, when you do this activity out in your community, what I want you to do is buy sugar cubes. And I want you to set it up ahead of time for how much sugar cubes are in each of the drinks. Now. I don't have um, the sugar cubes here with me, unfortunately. I, I, I don't know where they are, I misplaced them. But do this handout with your community members with the sugar cubes so that they can see what you're talking about so that it becomes real to them. Now here you have the fruit flavored drink, powdered reconstituted. So how much sugar would you guess is in that? Now I'm going to say like here, I have a fruit flavored drink. I'm going to tell you something about this particular one in just a minute. But let's say that it was the regular Kool-Aid, right? That's what we usually think about when we think about fruit flavored drink. Substitute that for Kool-Aid. Say this is lemon, lemonade Kool-Aid, lemon Kool-Aid. How much sugar would you put in there? Well, according to the labels, if you were to go and read the labels for lemon Kool-Aid, it could have as much as six and a quarter tablespoons of sugar. So of those cubes, you have six cubes of sugar in there. Now, this particular one comes from something I often use, and I got the question earlier about sweeteners. I use a lot, I use Crystal Light. Um, this is what I drink a lot in my flavored water. I, I drink a lot of water, but I don't like necessarily to taste the just water by itself all day. So I don't drink a lot of, Plain water, I probably should. But what I do is I add crystal light to my water. And crystal light, then you can see with the added sugar, it's zero, zero. So if you have crystal light, that's zero in your water. What about sparkling water? I don't have sparkling water with me, but sparkling water is going to be the same as water and it's going to be zero as well, zero sugar. None of those cues. Now I like look at, okay, well, what about a um, um, grapefruit juice cocktail, right? We say, oh, well, Minute Maid grapefruit juice, you know, there are advertisements that say, hey, have it for your breakfast. Hey, drink grapefruit juice, it's good for you. No, you need to look at the sugar. You need to look at the sugar because that grapefruit juice has 13 cubes of sugar, 13 cubes of sugar in your grapefruit juice, okay? so. It's something to think about when you do the demonstration with your community members, have those 13 cubes of sugar there for them to drink. What about your Coke? Someone's gonna say, oh, I'm just gonna have a can of Coke, but that can of Coke is gonna have 10, 10 cubes of sugar. So we wanna educate our community members about that. How about iced tea? You know, I got you here, Nesty iced tea. It's gonna have eight and a half cubes of sugar. So we want to do this type of activity with our community members to make it real with them. Unfortunately, we're doing this over Zoom and I don't have the cubes of sugar with me, but do it yourself. Go to your grocery store, buy cube sugar, 
and say and put down right in front of you grapefruit juice. I'm gonna have one serving. It's gonna have 13 of those cues of sugar. So those are the activities that we want to make it real for our community members. So that is the session of controlling for diabetes. As we mentioned, it's very important that you teach your community members that diabetes comes from the insulin not working sufficiently enough. Um, there's three types of diabetes. We learned about type one diabetes, which is the, the cells have been destroyed. They no longer make any insulin. Type two diabetes is most common, what you're gonna see, and particularly in our community, we wanna educate them about type two diabetes. And then there's gestational diabetes. We also want to teach our community members that you know you have blood sugar in your foods. So how to read the food labels to monitor how much sugar we're taking in so that we can control for diabetes. When you're doing this on the community, please quiz your community members. What is diabetes? So what's a normal blood sugar? Normal blood sugar is 99 milligrams per deciliter or less. 100 milligrams of deciliter to 125 is pre-diabetes. That puts you at risk factor for developing diabetes later. And greater than 126, 126 milligrams per deciliter or greater is diabetes. There are several different ways to test for blood sugar. You can do a fasting blood glucose. That's where you don't eat for four to eight hours before you do the test. But you can also do a random blood sugar. That's going to happen at health fair. Um, and then if they have a random blood sugar greater than 200, they're at risk of diabetes. So you want to get them um, educated about it. We learned that the, the um, risk factors for um, diabetes, of course, being overweight, physical inactivity, eating foods high in sugars, family history, of course, we can't control that. Our age, we can't control that. But it, it's important for us to be aware of those risk factors for diabetes. What are some of the symptoms of diabetes? Well, blurred vision, as I said, my brother, you know, that was his first sign that something was wrong. He had blurred vision. He went to his doctor, got his blood sugar checked and learned he had diabetes. It could also include frequent urination, um, increased thirst and those other symptoms. So that is the session for today. I know we need to move on because I wanna give the uh, next group time, but I wanna open it up right now for any questions. Does anyone have any questions? comments. Okay, I hope I did that. I hope that there are no questions because I did a great job at presenting the session to you. Um, Hi, everybody. Welcome back from the break. Um, we are going to jump right back into um, teach backs. Uh, it's the first teach back coming up. Actually, I'm going to start second one. Is make traditional African American dishes are healthy. You can see the group listed on the screen. Um, I'm not sure who from the group is going to be taking the lead, but whoever you are, please feel free. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good morning. Okay. Great. Welcome. 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 Welcome, group members, to the session on how to make heart healthy eating an everyday family reunion. This session begins. Um, on page 254 in the original manual. At, last, at the last session, we talked about what you need to know about diabetes. What is diabetes? Diabetes results when the body does not make enough insulin or cannot use it well, causing glucose or sugar to build up in the blood. As a result, the body does not function well. What are the risk factors for diabetes? Risk factors for diabetes include being overweight, family members with diabetes, being age 40 or older, physical inactivity, history of gestational diabetes, or giving birth to at least one baby weighing nine pounds or more, having high blood pressure, or having cholesterol levels that are not normal, where your HDL cholesterol is low or triglycerides are high. What are the ABCs of diabetes control? The A and ABC stands for A1C test. This simple lab test shows a person's average blood glucose over the last three months. 
the A1C number to aim for is below seven. The B in ABC is for blood pressure. The higher your blood pressure, the harder your heart has to work. High blood pressure increases your risk for a heart attack, stroke, or damage to your kidneys and eyes. Your blood pressure should be below 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. The C in ABC is for cholesterol. Keep cholesterol at normal levels. Bad cholesterol or LDL can build up and clog your arteries. It can lead to a heart attack or a stroke. People with type 2 diabetes need to keep their ADL cholesterol below 100 milligrams per deciliter. How does diabetes affect your body? Diabetes can cause damage to the heart, brain, kidneys, and eyes. It can also cause nerve damage, which reduces swelling in your feet. Diabetes can also affect blood flow in your legs and feet which can lead to sores that do not heal and often leads to amputation. At the end of the last session, you made a pledge to prevent or control diabetes. Please share what you did. What went well for you? Did you have any problems? How did you solve these problems? At this time, we will allow two minutes for group members to respond. Has everyone completed their family health history? At this time, we would, we would give a prize to the group members who have completed their family health history. Does anyone want to share what you have learned about your family health history? At this time, we will allow about five minutes for group members to respond. Alex Haley, a Pulitzer Prize winning African-American author of Roots said, in every conceivable manner, the family is the link to our past and bridge to our future. What does this quote mean to you? We will allow two to three minutes for group members to respond. What you choose to eat can make a difference in your heart health. During this session, you will learn how to, one, choose a variety of foods for heart health, two, Learn how to make traditional African-American and soul food dishes more heart healthy. Three, identify serving sizes and the number of recommended servings for each food group. And four, learn about the history of some traditional African-American dishes and foods. I failed to introduce myself, but I am Michelle Hughes. And Elizabeth will begin um, conducting the session with eat a variety of heart healthy foods. Good morning. I'm Elizabeth Riley, and I'll be sharing with you as um, Melissa have shared, conducting the session on eat a variety of healthy heart foods. Why is it important to eat a variety of health, health, heart healthy foods? Allow about five minutes for group members to respond. And they can write their answers on the blackboard or on a large piece of paper taped to the wall. Eating a variety of foods that are lower in saturated fat, trans fat, cholesterol, salt and sodium, sugar and calories can, have, can help you have a healthy heart. One food cannot give all the nutrients in the amounts your body need. And there's some more information. Nutrients in the food we eat includes carbohydrates, protein, fats, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. African-American and soul food dishes. This session will help group members think about the foods they eat. Some favorite traditional African-American and soaked food dishes are very nutritious. Other dishes can be prepared in more health, heart healthy ways. Soul food combines traditional African food and food preparation methods with the African-American experience in the United States from slavery throughout today. Let's take some time to talk about soul food by answering these three questions. 
What does soul food mean to you? What food foods would you call soul food? What are some of the soul food dishes that you and your family like to eat? We're gonna allow a few minutes for the group members to respond. What are some foods that you think are native to our African ancestors? The foods below, we're gonna add the foods below, I'm sorry, if they are not mentioned. Grains, legumes, yams and sorghum, watermelon, pumpkin, okra, wild lemons and oranges, dates, figs, eggplant, cucumber, onion, garlic, and leafy greens. What kind of cooking methods do you think were used by the ancestors of African-Americans in Africa? Dishes such as stews and soups were cooked in one pot over an open fire. Spices and seasoning were used to flavor meals and prevent spoilage. And there's some more additional information. The ancestors of African-Americans often told stories and recited oral history while traditional dishes cooked for hours. This oral tradition is still a part of African-American family gatherings, such as Sunday dinners or family reunions. African-Americans were resourceful during slavery and created filling and tasty meals with the small provisions provided. Some of these resourceful cooking skills are part of African-American food traditions today. African-Americans were skilled at recreating leftovers such as salmon croquettes. Today, salmon croquettes are a special dish on their own and are not reserved for leftovers only. Examples of common foods and dishes prepared and eaten by African-Americans include breads and grains, such as cornbread, biscuits, and cornbread stuffing, which is dressing, pea, bean, and nut dishes, such as sakatash, which is a corn and lima bean dish, black eyed peas, butter beans usually made with black eyed peas of meat and rice, field peas and peanuts, rice and pasta dishes, such as red beans and rice, jambalaya and baked macaroni and cheese, vegetable dishes such as green beans, collard greens, carrot and raisin slaw, raisin salad, I'm sorry, coleslaw, candy yams, potato salad, cabbage, okra, squash, and sweet potato pie. Fruits such as peaches and bananas, meat and poultry dishes such as chicken gumbo, meatloaf, pork chop, lion or lean varieties, and chicken creole. Fish and fish dishes such as catfish stew, whitening, porridge, Simon croquette, and markel. To make lasting life changes, you need to start slowly. The Soul Food Makeover recipe in the With Every Heart Beat is Life manual can help you prepare traditional African-American family meals in heart healthy ways. I will give you more recipes later in this session. Try each recipe to see how you like it and then put them all together for a delicious and heart healthy family feast. Some additional information. African-American soul food dishes tend to be prepared differently by each family. In the African-American tradition, families and communities use the foods and ingredients that were available to them. African-American traditional dishes were passed down orally. So there's no correct way to prepare dishes. Just keep in mind, healthy, heart healthy cooking skills we have been learning and apply them to your family recipes. 
And this time I'll uh, turn it over to Satasha who will be sharing with a heart healthy eating plan for African-American families. Good morning, my name is Shatasha Hubbard. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'll be doing section- You're welcome, Satasha. Okay. Section three, a heart healthy eating plan for African-American families. We can take steps to improve the way we eat and still enjoy our traditional dishes. The first step is to learn which foods we should eat more often. The second step is to learn the amount of these foods we should eat each day. And I'll show picture card 8.1, which is um, pictures of the different food groups. Okay. A heart healthy eating plan is useful. It shows both the types and amounts of foods we can choose for better health. Okay, Let's see. And we'll go over the heart healthy eating plan handout on page 270. And this is how it looks. And it just has examples of um, each food group and the different types of food you can choose from that food group. The food choices you make each day affect your health. We will talk about the ways to choose healthy foods. We will. We also will discuss the recommended number of servings for each food group for a 2000 calorie diet. Make grains six to eight servings a day. Make at least half of your grains whole grains. Eat at least three servings of whole grain cereals, breads, rice, or pasta every day. Look at the food label and choose grain products that have whole grains as the first ingredient. Some examples of whole grain ingredients are whole wheat, whole oats, oatmeal, and whole rye. For a change, try brown rice or whole wheat pasta instead of white rice or pasta. Snack on ready to eat whole grain cereal, such as toasted oat cereal. Also try popcorn with little or no salt or butter as a snack. One ounce of grains is one serving. In general, one ounce of grains is one slice of bread, about one cup of ready to eat cereal, or a half a cup of cooked rice, cooked pasta, or cooked cereal. Vegetables, four to five servings a day. Eat more green vegetables such as green beans, broccoli, okra, and dark leafy greens. Eat more orange vegetables such as carrots, squash, and sweet potatoes. Eat more nuts and legumes such as lima beans and black eyed peas. Stock up on frozen vegetables for quick and easy cooking in the microwave. Sorry, I'm pages out of order. Buy fresh vegetables in season. They cost less and are likely to be at their peak flavor. Plan some meals around a vegetable main dish such as vegetable stir fry or soup. Choose no salt added canned vegetables. Fruits, four to five servings a day. Choose fresh frozen canned or dried fruit. Go easy on fruit juices because they contain a lot of calories and sugar. Try to eat whole fruit, oranges, apples, mangoes more often than fruit juice. Keep a bowl of whole fruit on the table or counter or in the refrigerator. Fat-free or low-fat milk and milk products, two to three servings a day. Get your calcium-rich foods. Choose fat-free or low-fat milk, yogurt, and other milk products. If you usually use whole milk, switch gradually to fat-free milk. Try reduced fat, which is 2% milk, then low-fat, 1% milk, and then fat-free milk. Have fat-free or low-fat yogurt for a snack. If you are lactose intolerant, try lactose-free products such as yogurt, cheese, and lactose-free milk. Lean meats, poultry, and fish, six or fewer servings a day. Choose low-fat or lean meats and poultry. Select meat cuts that are low in fat and ground beef that is extra lean. Eat a variety of foods with protein. Choose more fish. Choose lean turkey, roast beef or ham instead of fatty lunch meat such as regular bologna or salami. Bake raw or grilled meat. Nuts, seeds, and legumes, four to five servings a week. Choose cooked and dry, 
choose cooked and dried beans, nuts, seeds, and peas for rich sources of protein and fiber. Fats and oils, two, two to three servings a day. Get most of your fat from sources such as fish, nuts, and vegetable oils. Limit solid fats such as butter, stick margarine, shortening, and lard, as well as foods that contain these fats. Sweets and added sugars, five or fewer servings a week. Choose foods and beverages that are low in calories and sugar. Use the nutrition facts label to compare the calorie and sugar content of foods and beverages. Choose fat-free milk or other unsweetened beverages most often. So they unsweetened cereal and add fruit. <clears throat> okay, what is one serving of a cooked vegetable? One serving of a cooked vegetable would be half a cup. How much milk or yogurt is considered one serving? Uh, one serving of milk or yogurt would be one cup. Can you give an example of a one ounce serving from the grains group? An example of, one, of a one ounce serving from, from the grains group would include one slice of bread, about one cup of ready to eat cereal, or a half a cup of cooked cereal such as oatmeal, a half a cup of cooked rice or pasta. And what counts as one serving of fruit? One ser serving of fruit would consist of one medium apple, banana or orange, one cup of raw or canned fruit or 100% fruit juice, or a fourth a cup of dry fruit. What is one serving of cooked beans? Half a cup is one serving of cooked beans. Section four, how to choose heart healthy foods. We are going to do a group activity. During this activity, we will learn how to make better food choices. Okay, on pages 262 and 263, there's a layout of Tina's breakfast, breakfast, lunch, and dinner menu. Um, on each, on each uh, menu, the food group section will be empty as uh, also the better choices menu. And I'll just choose one item from each menu to go over. So we'll start with breakfast. Um, we'll talk about which food, which group uh, each food belongs to and what changes would Tina make to make uh, the breakfast more healthy, more heart healthy. So I'll choose the biscuit. Uh, the food group that the biscuit belongs to is the grains group. And a better option besides the biscuit would be whole grain toast or English muffin. For lunch, we'll go over a large soft drink. The food group that the large soft drink belongs to is the sweets food group. And a better choice for Tina to make um, instead of the large soft drink would be water, a diet soft drink, or fat-free milk. And um, a choice from the dinner menu would be white rice and gravy. It belongs to the grains, fats, and oils food group. And better choice would be brown rice with peas and carrots. What are some ways to eat less saturated fat, trans fat, cholesterol, and sodium? When shopping, choose a variety of whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. Choose low fat or fat free milk products, salad dressings, and mayonnaise. Choose lean cuts of meat, trim away extra fat. Use food labels to choose foods lower in saturated fat, trans fat, cholesterol, sodium, sugar, and calories. When cooking, use vegetable oil or soft tub margarine instead of butter or lard. Cook with low fat methods such as baking, broiling, or boiling without added fat rather than frying. When eating, cut back on fats, oils, and sweets. Remove skin from poultry, throw away the skin and do not eat it. Choose low fat or fat-free milk products, salad dressings, and mayonnaise. Eat no more than four egg yolks each week. Eat fewer high calorie foods without much added nutrition value, such as high fat lunch meats, pies, cakes, cookies, crackers, and chips. Drink fewer sodas. Eat smaller portion sizes. Thank you for participating in this activity. You did great. Now you can make healthier choices for you and your family. Section five, cooking with children. Uh, we'll go over the Cooking with Children handout on pages 271 and 272. This 
page on that side. And on the cooking with children, I'll just choose um, one age group to go over. So cooking with, cooking with your children is a good way to help them develop healthy eating habits. Most children enjoy helping in the kitchen. While they help you prepare a meal, you can talk to them about healthy foods. Children like to eat the food they make. This is also a good way to get them to try new healthy foods. You can show your children how to help you prepare meals. Here are ways that, that children of different ages can help in the kitchen. And today I'll go over the three-year-olds. Three-year-olds can wrap potatoes and foil for baking, knead and shape dough, mix ingredients, pour liquids, shake liquids in the covered container, apply soft, spread, soft spreads, and put things in the trash. Be sure to have children wash their hands before and after helping in the kitchen. Be patient with spills and mistakes. Remember that the goal is to help your children learn about healthy eating. Okay, other side, let them be creative. Set out three or four healthy foods and let your children make a new snack or sandwich from them. Use foods your children can eat without choking. Um, start with a new kind of bread, whole grain or rye, whole grain crackers or graham crackers, mini rice cakes or popcorn cakes, small bagels, small pieces of pita bread. Spreads could include low-fat cream cheese or cheese spread, low-fat peanut butter, bean dip, jelly or jam with no added sugar, and the toppings could include slices of apple or banana, raisins or other dried fruit, strawberries, slices of cucumber or squash, cherry tomatoes cut in small pieces, or slices of cheese or hard-boiled egg. As you help your children make the new snack or sandwich, talk about why it is healthy. Point out the different food groups that are included in the snack or sandwich. Explain that eating a variety of foods is healthy. Ask why the snack or sandwich tastes good. Is it sweet, juicy, chewy, or crunchy? As parents, you can teach your children how to develop healthy eating habits that will last a lifetime. For good health and proper growth, children need to eat a variety of different foods every day. When children are offered a balanced diet, diet daily, they will develop good eating habits. Can you think of other ways to get children involved in helping to prepare healthy meals? Additional information. We Can, which is Ways to Enhance Children's Activity and Nutrition, is an education program to help children ages eight to 13 maintain a healthy weight. The program includes tips and activities for parents on how to keep the family healthy by improving food choices, increasing physical activity and reducing screen time. Next, Savithia will go over section six. Good morning and thank you, Shatasha. I am Tabithia Heidelberg and in this section, we will discuss soul food makeovers, six traditional African-American dishes for an everyday family value, um, family reunion. Now let's take a look at the six um, soul food makeovers, six traditional African-American dishes for an everyday family reunion. Handouts pages 273 through 278. Here are six traditional recipes that have been made over for your heart. These recipes contain several heart healthy changes and substitutions like vegetable oil and fat free milk to replace butter and whole milk in the sweet potato recipe. Evaporated fat free milk and vegetable oil spray replace whole milk and butter in the baked macaroni and cheese dish. Soft tub margarine is used instead of butter in the candied yams recipe. The chicken is baked and not fried in the crispy oven fried chicken recipe. The skin is also taken off to reduce the fat. There is no salt added to the green beans and vegetable oil spray is used to saute onions and garlic instead of cooking oil or grease. High fat meats or oil such as fat back, salt pork, ham hocks and bacon grease were not used to season the green beans. And fat-free or low-fat 1% buttermilk replaces whole buttermilk in the cornbread recipe. And soft margarine is used instead of butter. These six recipes show how small changes can make traditional dishes more heart healthy. Try these traditional recipes or experiment on your own with these recipes using the ingredient substitutions. 
Now let's re review um, today's key points. So we've learned today that a heart, we've learned today about a heart healthy um, diet and about traditional African-American diets. The traditional African-American diet provides a variety of foods that are lower in fat and sodium, such as bread, peas, greens, rice, vegetables, fruit, poultry, fish, and milk products. What are some foods that we should eat less often? Some foods that we should limit um, that are high in saturated fat, trans fat, sodium, sugar, and calories, including high fat foods such as fried fish, fried chicken, fatty meats, and high fat cheeses, salty foods such as potato chips and cured meats, high fat and high fat foods such as pastries, pies, honey buns, cookies, and chocolate, and sugary foods such as candy and soft drinks. How can the heart healthy eating plan be used to choose foods that are heart healthy? Use the heart healthy eating plan to choose foods that are lower in saturated fats, trans fat, cholesterol, sodium, sugar from each of the five food groups. The eating plan also shows the number of servings that you would need from each food group each day. Why is it helpful to know how much we need to eat from each food group each day? That is because when you know the amount of food you need to eat every day, it can help you get the right amount of calories that you need. Our weekly pledge. You've learned a, you have learned a lot today on how to make your favorite dishes in a heart healthy way. Now let's think about how you can apply what you have learned. Please think of one change you can make in your everyday life to eat in a heart healthy way with your family. This will be your pledge for the week. Be specific about what you plan to do, how you plan to do it, and when you will start. Some examples are, I will make baked chicken instead of fried chicken for my next family meal. I will eat more vegetable oil and one more fruit each day starting tomorrow. Would anyone like to share his or her pledge with the group? If so, you can write down your pledges on a sheet of paper. Keeping a personal diary uh, a personal value in mind would help you keep a heart healthy um, eating plan as part of your family life. Remember that a personal value is a quality that you consider important to you. Today's value is fun. Fun can help you stay positive in your efforts to improve your health and the health of your family. As stated in today's quote, in every conceivable manner, the family is the link to our past bridge our past and our bridge to our future. Fun can help you overcome challenges, allowing you to laugh when you want to cry. Fun can also motivate you to turn your pledge into permanent habits. How could you use another, how could you use fun or another value to help you keep your pledge? We will discuss the results of your pledges on next week. Don't forget to work on your pledges to be more physically active, to cut back on the salt, sodium, saturated fat, trans fat, and cholesterol, to help you reach and keep a healthy weight, and to prevent or control diabetes. I would like to thank you for coming out on today and attending today's session. What do you think about the session today? I'm looking forward to seeing you again at the next session. We will talk more about eating in a heart healthy way even when time or money is tight. Again, I would like to thank you. And this concludes today's session of six traditional African-American meals to be made over in a heart healthy way. Hey, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for presenting today. Um, so you discussed a lot of different things and when you're doing a presentation out in the community, you, you want to, you know, like you were just doing reading from the manual, but then when possible, share your personal experiences. Um, and I can share just a couple of my personal experiences um, with you now. Um, you know, growing up, I loved collard greens and I still love collard greens. And my grandmother, she used to cook collard greens with lard. So she would take lard and put it in the pot. And I didn't watch her unfortunately, so I don't know how to cook collard greens exactly like she did, but I know that she cooked collard greens in a way that wasn't heart healthy. 
But lately I've learned or I've started trying to cook collard greens in a more healthy way. And so one of the things that I do now is that um, I've learned that one of the ways you can cook your collard greens, and you know, I encourage you to try this, is you know, you can get some fresh garlic. Um, and you know, you have that fresh garlic, it comes in a clove that has like several different lumps of garlic in it together. And you peel it back and then there's like this little yellow or whitish yellow piece and you can mince that. Mince it means chop it up in really tiny pieces. And I, what I do is I'll, I'll mince some garlic and I'll cut a, a, a onion into smaller pieces, um, like make a diced onions. And then I'll heat some of And then I'll add collard greens in it and water and a tiny bit of vinegar. And I'm starting to get close to collard greens that taste better. I try to avoid salt, adding any salt to the collard greens. And, and I think those are some of the things that we want to try to teach community members. Is say, you don't have to get rid of the foods you love, but try to make them in a more heart healthy way, using things like olive oil instead of butter or lard um, and using, as it was shown in some of your other recipes, low fat milk or no fat milk in your foods instead of whole milk. So those are some of the strategies that you want to talk to your community members about and say, hey, you know, change is gonna be hard, but we have to figure out how we make those small changes over time to eat healthier. We need to cut back on the salt. Try to get the salt off the table. Now, yeah, I'm still struggling with that too. I, I do still add some salt to some of my foods, but I've been trying to, as much as possible, add other seasonings like garlic, like onion powder, um, or like other spices instead of adding salt. So with your health, heart healthy, you want to teach those. You know, one of the things that have been a real problem to our community is that and, I, and this is the African, this is the American community in general, is that we've been, become really reliant on fast foods. So a lot of us will just eat at fast foods instead of cooking at home. Um, my grandfather, um, when I was growing up, just about every morning, he would go out to Hardee's and he would get him a Hardee's biscuit sandwich and some tea. And um, that would be his breakfast. And so that over time, it creates a situation where he's not living heart healthy. Um, he's eating the fast foods. There are other examples of, you know, for dinner, my mother sometimes would go out to um, like Kentucky Fried Chicken to get the chicken there. And we can see that those aren't, uh, um, those don't promote heart healthy. So what we have to do is we have to start working with our community members and thinking about how we can make behaviors more heart healthy. Now that takes time um, and it takes work. And part of that work is teaching this manual just like you did with that session. So I'd like to thank everyone. You did a wonderful job on teaching the session, but really think about how you can then make it real to your community members by adding in your own stories. You know, it's a struggle for all of us. I, you know, personally, you know, I'm overweight, you know, might be obese <laughs> at the moment. I know I need to lose weight, but it's one that what we have to do is use the manual to increase awareness. Teaching the manual alone, though, will not work, right? What's our goal here? Our goal is to have um, children know their grandparents. So our goal is to have those individuals live long enough so they can know their grandchildren. That means taking on healthier habits. We know that African-Americans die earlier than other communities, white communities, Asian communities, because of some of the heart health habits that we have, because we eat foods that are higher in salt and in fat, um, because we don't exercise as much as we should, um, because we don't control our cholesterol or our diabetes. So the importance of teaching the manual is to help bring awareness about, around, about how to live those heart healthy lifestyles. But bringing the awareness is not enough. We also have to take those steps 
to do activities with our community members to get them out and walk, right? Starting walking clubs, right? Um, so that they can get out and do the exercise. To get them to eat healthier. So maybe having food classes that teach them how to substitute. Instead of the salt, let's use other herbs. Um, instead of the um, high fat lard or oils, let's use some of the other oils like olive oil or other cooking oils that are lower in fat. Those are the habits that we want to teach our community members to use. Now, we are, unfortunately, in a very stressful time, not just for our community, but for all of the communities in the US and throughout the world because of the coronavirus um, um, pandemic. So during this time, and what we're gonna do now is have a quick discussion about what we can do as an organization and as a group to start thinking about what activities we can roll out in our community that one, use this with every heartbeat is life manual and the information in it to make our community members aware, but also two, what are some of those activities we can do with our community members throughout the year that can help them live healthier lifestyles. Now, right now we're gonna have to consider that things are kind of shut down. I'm no longer living in the US, I, I live in Canada now. So um, we have different restrictions on us. So I know that right now we can't meet in a public place. You know, right now, even the gyms are closed. You cannot go to a gym here um, in Ontario. Um, but what are some of the strategies we can use in the coming months that can help us to use this information in the With Every Heartbeat is Life to educate our community members? We wanna think about that. How would you teach the manual to your church? So what I, from what I understand, and please, Ms. Jackson, correct me if I'm wrong, there are 13 churches represented here. That's How are correct. we gonna use, pardon? That is correct. Yes. So how are we gonna use this manual in our 13 churches over the next over the coming months to educate them. Now we haven't completed yet. We have one more week, um, one more month. Um, next month will be our last session, and during that time we will have our graduation. But come um, April, March, come April, come May, come June, we're teaching you how to use this manual so that you can then use it to teach your congregations. We want to hear back from you that 13 churches are having this manual taught in their community. But as I said, awareness is not enough. We also wanna think about what are some of the activities we're gonna do over the next six months to a year to help our community members. Now, right now, as I said, we're on lockdown. Unfortunately, we don't know how long this lockdown is gonna go on. And some of us are at different states of lockdown. But are there activities that we can start thinking about in our communities, you know, we can have walking clubs that are six feet apart, right? That's something that we can do. Um, or walking out in the, when the weather gets better, right now it might not be good, but that's something that we can do. Can we start planning for um, a food garden, right? Having a, a healthy food garden to teach community members how to raise some of those foods. So, you know, we just talked about how African-Americans during times of slavery um, and even in, on the continent of Africa, how they would grow their own foods and how they would take those steps to eat healthy, to um, eat beans, to eat vegetables. And so can we start thinking about strategies now that can be done in March, in April, in May to have a food garden at our churches? We have 13 churches. Hopefully we can have 13 food gardens, right? Even if we don't have a food garden, is it possible to have a, a food, a, a farm, um, um, you know, farmer's market where we can have those at our churches and expose our community members to healthier foods? You know, when I first started working in the government, there was something that we used to talk about a lot called food deserts. Um, do, does someone know what a food desert is? Can someone unmute themselves and tell me what a food desert is? Not having access to fresh fruits and vegetables in your local community. Exactly. So right. in, in some of our communities, particularly in the inner city, the only place that our community members may have to shop for foods 
maybe a convenience store. You know, you're starting to see a resurgence of dollar stores in the communities. And what do they sell? They sell, yeah, it's, it's food items for less than a dollar or that are very cheap, but they're not healthy for you. They have high amounts of salt. They have high amounts of sugar. And so a food desert is where you have a situation where it's hard for individuals to get fresh fruits. It's hard for them to find an apple to eat or, or a fresh orange to eat because all they have to shop at are convenience stores or other types of stores that don't have or don't carry those fresh fruits. So what are some of the strategies that we can use in communities that have food deserts? We can Dr. think about- Excuse me, Dr. Ivy. Yes. In Itabina, Mississippi, that is where, um, what's the college there in Itabina, y'all? Um, Mississippi Valley State University. Yeah, Valley State University. Uh, there is not a, unless unless they've done something in the last year, and I need to check that out. Itabina is, I think it's like 15 miles to Greenwood, and there is a Walmart and a grocery store in Greenwood. But Itabina is, does not have a grocery store there. And that is where uh, the uh, Mississippi State Department of Health sponsored some churches that they had very large uh, gardens, uh, two churches in particular uh, that I've worked with that have had tremendous gardens that produce a lot of uh, fresh vegetables and fruits. So I think they are still, it being is still considered a, a food desert. That's it wonderful. is, Ella, and they did try to do a co-op there, and that was unsuccessful. So they are still a food desert. Mm -hmm. But the churches have done very well. Wonderful. So that's where we have to think about the strategies, like you're saying. So we, we know it's a food desert. You know that it has low um, access then to healthy foods. Like you said, having the food gardens could be one. Um, you mentioned the co-op there. It was unsuccessful, but let's think about why was it unsuccessful and can we try again? Um, another strategy might be what? Um, one of the other strategies, so you said it's 15 miles away. Now, our community members may find it, okay, it's difficult to get that 15 miles, but you can develop shopping clubs, right? where you have community members that get together, they pool their resources, and the, either they, they carpool to the grocery store once a week or have, however so often to get to the healthier food. So carpooling to grocery stores with community members, particularly when our community members like are elderly. So they might find it even harder to get out. They may not have access to a car or they may find it harder to get out because of their elderly situation for some reason, thinking about a um, carpool to help them get to, you know, and doing shopping clubs or going shopping for them. Those are things we want to think about as well that we can implement in our communities to really bring attention to better heart health. Let now, me interject again, Dr. Ivy, I'm sorry, but there one of, I think it was one of the churches, but also one of the government uh, programs have those senior citizen buses and yes. they did make uh, runs from uh, from Itabina down to Greenwood several times a week. Wonderful. So you're, you, you know, your community is already doing a lot of those things. We, we want to figure out one, how we can continue to do those things, how we can do more of it, how we can take this with every heartbeat is life manual. And what the manual does is help you to educate community members to make them aware. But it's those other activities, Ms. Jackson, that you're talking about that not only make them aware, but also help them to live a healthier lifestyle, help them to gain access to healthier foods. And that's what's going to help us to begin to address the disparities. We know that disparities exist in our community. I talked to Ms. Taylor often and, and she says that we have a problem in our community. We have to face the fact that members of our community are dying at younger ages. They're not living long enough to see and know their grandchildren. So how do we begin to, to change that curve? You know, it's, it's going to take some work. As, as I said myself, and I use myself as an example, I don't always eat right, right? 
I don't always exercise like I should, but I'm aware of it. And then I need to start taking those small steps that help me get there. Those small steps are what the manual is teaching you how to do. Read your food labels. We want to teach our community members to read the food label. So when you do your community activities, when you teach this manual out in your community, it's very important that you help them to understand how to read the food labels. I talked earlier about, well, hey, a can of Coke is 12 ounces, but we don't buy a can of Coke hardly anymore. We buy 16 ounces, we buy 20 ounces, or we buy big gulps. So teach them that, hey, if you're doing that, then understand that there's more sugar that you have in it. Read the food labels with salt. And you know, we before, and now it's been a couple months now, we did the salt chapter and we learned about how much salt you should get in a day. And according to the guidelines, particularly people with high blood pressure, they should have no more within 1,500 milligrams of salt a day. But the traditional Af American diets, not African-American only, but the traditional American diets have 4,000 milligrams of salt or more. And that's what's killing us. You know, that's what is causing our community to have these early, um, early deaths. So what we have to do is we have to work with community members to teach them better health habits using the manual. But in addition to teaching them the better health habits, we need to do activities as well. So I have already heard from Ms. Jackson, and you're already doing this, so it's nothing I have to teach you, but 13 churches, I hope, and we can work with you, to have 13 food um, gardens. So, you know, I want you to start thinking about potentially having gardens if possible. Uh, it doesn't take, you know, a, a lot of land to, to do it in. Um, you know, start thinking about maybe having um, vans that can take people to the grocery store if they live out in a food desert. Um, starting walking clubs. I know right now we're all, um, you know, in our houses because of the virus, we're quarantined, but thinking about walking clubs. Um, we also want to think about how to get our community members access to those vaccinations. You know, right now, uh, the coronavirus vaccinations are state dependent. So we don't have a lot of control um, over their distribution because they're being done um, by the state. But maybe we can start thinking about how do we educate our community members about the coronavirus? How do we start working with those state or local government agencies to say, hey, we need the vaccine in these areas. Our community members go to these health centers and we need to ensure that the vaccine is getting to those health centers. They're putting it at some big stadium that's on some big university that's in the white neighborhoods and our families members can't get to those stadiums then we don't have access to the virus, um, the vaccine. So how can we help our community members gain access to those vaccines? Who do we need to talk to? Who do we need to work with in our cities and in our towns and our communities to make sure that access is given to, to those groups? You know, but also education. Can, is there something that we can do in, in January, which is almost over, or February or March to educate individuals about the vaccination. I think Dr. Fauci said that it probably won't be until September. It probably won't be until September until enough people are vaccinated um, to, um, to, uh, against the virus to reach that herd immunity. But we, don't, we wanna make sure that our community has access. We gotta break down those barriers and we can't sit around and wait for others to do it for us. We have to think about how we can take um, control, how we can, you know, be there to advocate for our community, how we can say, hey, look, we need it in our community as well. Does your plan in Mississippi include our community? You know, if they're writing up their state plans and it doesn't include the Black community, then you have to be advocates to say, no, this isn't right. We need to have it here as well. So I, I'm going to stop, I get off my soapbox, because um, I did want to have a discussion and uh, Ms. Jackson and Ms. Taylor, if you can help me out with it about some of the things that can be done over the course of a, the next few months. We, we don't have to do it all right now, but we need the group to start thinking about how you're going to use the manual to educate your community. Um, 
right now we're on lockdown. Can you have the handouts included in one of your church programs um, once a month? Let's, let's think about ways that we can, can use the manual and use other activities in our community to help the community. So I'll stop there and Ms. Jackson and Ms. Taylor, and we can just have a quick discussion um, if you don't mind. And we won't take too much time. We, we can talk about it later, but I just wanted to hear what are some of your ideas um, about incorporating the manual and activities into your program? Well, I didn't, well, I didn't mean to indicate to you that we were doing a, a lot. We're, we're just doing, we're just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot that we can do. So this is a great discussion to, to have with this group because they know their church and their community better individually than we know. I would just say for our church, we'd probably use the Zoom uh, method, and uh, I, I'm not real sure how we'll be able to get the handouts there because they are they are very stingy with the uh, uh, Facebook uh, presentations that we have. Uh, I think all the different organizations in the church want to have a piece of that and so uh, for the help ministry to ask for very much is is kind of hard so that's something we need to try and work through and it's five of us from our church that's a part of this uh, program uh, i was just going to say uh, dr ivy uh i i talked with um at least the two groups, or or the maybe just group two, uh, recently. No, I, we talked with most most of the group. I think Miss Jackson. We and, did. Uh, yeah. So we talked about continuing, uh, you know, our uh, Zoom uh, meetings periodically, and I think you brought up some good ideas, and uh, I think that's something for us to handle, you know, in terms of planning uh, through uh, this coalition that we have of these 13 churches. And, um, you know, we may not um, have the opportunity at every church, but we may be able to have some joint, you know, activities. And right now, while we're in this virtual platform, uh, many of, uh, any educational programs or whatever uh, we will be having uh, is really available to all of the churches uh, if their you know congregants are able to get on uh, you know the Zoom. So I think we might be doing that some of those things initially because it's not looking like we're going to be back uh, very soon you know uh, in person in our churches. Um, I was trying to, to type into the chat um, before I forget that uh, Dr. Dobbs, our state uh, medical director, uh, announced, many of you probably know, some people have been trying to get the vaccine and they have, their appointments are completely filled. Uh, he had said until uh, the beginning of February but he announced uh, yesterday that they will have, a, he ex, he's expecting a larger volume of vaccines on the 26th of uh, January. And uh, he said, even though people have been calling their number and been told they can't take any more reservations, that they probably will be taking more reservations but for the period after January the 26th. So I was trying to put a note in there with the number and the website. And I was also adding to uh, please continue to check with the community health centers in your area. Uh, Jackson Hines is the one here, you know, closest to us, but uh, they do plan to give uh, vaccines to the community health centers because they've um, realized that, you know, African Americans so far have been significantly underrepresented, but when they uh, gave vaccines to the federally funded community health uh, clinics, uh, it increased 
the number of African Americans who got the vaccines because a, a large majority used those centers. So I think this this uh, group, you know, that we have here, if we continue to meet, we'll be able to share information. We'll be uh, better able to plan activities that we can either all have at our different churches or we can, you know, jointly. Uh, sponsors. So I'm looking forward to us doing some uh, some planning. And Miss Jackson has um, said, agreed, that we should start right away with our activities in March. And I, I think they already have a joint activity for February the 6th, which is uh, that annual Go Red event that the Mississippi um, Congress of Congregational Network of Nurses and Advocates. Okay, I'm trying to read, help me. Okay, uh, we'll be having uh, on February the 6th. And in addition to those people who are normally in there, this entire um, you know, group of churches, I I'm certain are invited and will be getting the information to share with their congregants. And um, one, uh, it looks like uh, Miss Miss Jackson, I'm sure, and Miss Harris can share their planned um, program of speakers. And Dr. Ivy, I think you'll be happy with the information they're going to share, even though it's you know for heart disease and and you know directed toward women. Uh, we we also. Uh, been able to uh, acquire someone from NIH to talk briefly about the uh, coronavirus. So I'll let Ms. Harris and Ms. Jackson just share that as an upcoming event with everybody. Go ahead, Mary, please. She's on the committee. The program is up so that you can see it. We do have NIH that we did talk with yesterday and they are looking for a representative for us so that we can also share a little bit more about the coronavirus. As you can see- Vaccine. I mean, vaccine, excuse me, yes. And you, you can also see that we have Faith Cotton, who is one of our members of this group is also going to do a presentation. She'll be also talking about the coronavirus, what's now, what's um, next for us. We also have uh, Dr. Joyce Wade, who is a pulmonologist, who will also be talking about how heart vaccine, lungs all work together. Uh, so she will also be on our program. We have an exercise segment, and that is right there with Xavier Burns. We also have a psychologist there who will be talking to us and helping us cope with some of the stressors of heart health itself, also with the coronavirus and the things that people are going through currently. We have a lead cardiologist who is a member of the Association of Black Cardiologists, and that's Dr. Alexander. She's one of our regular speakers. She will also be doing a presentation on heart health um, and heart disease itself, prevention, the things and ways that people can better take care of themselves. That's the, the nut of our program right now. We do have a question and answer session to follow with that also so that people are able to ask questions and get engaged. And we've also talked briefly with NIH about possibly having um, more programs a little bit later regarding the covert vaccine and making sure that our people are vaccinated. And Mary has already sent out to everybody in the group uh, this invitation. So I hope that y'all are sharing it to everybody that's in your database to send it out to your sororities, other fraternities, other churches that are in your community, but uh, particularly getting the members of your church uh, group to sign on and participate. There's also one other thing at the beginning of the program, there will be a video and the video will go over some of the warning signs and some of the information regarding a heart health that's actually in our manual. 
Would, would you be able to? to see, oh, no. I'm, I was just going to say, I'm sorry, Ms. Taylor, for interrupting, but just would you be able to see? It looks like the flyer has a, a Zoom link. Um, I guess I need to ask you two questions. Um, is there a limit to how many people can join the Zoom link? I know sometimes meetings are, you know, there's no a limit. limit. No, no limit on this one. Okay, so maybe you can send it out to the group here so that more um, people from other churches can join as well and be in the meeting to hear the discussion um, as well. It's, it has already been sent. The only thing different is they don't have the yellow where I've got the NIH. This okay. is my copy for me to know I need to still plug in some things. Mm -hmm. Can you send this flyer? Okay, uh, Mary, would you send it to the information to uh, Tierra? Some of our members um, who are associated with the community programs probably would like to join. And is there any kind of registration or you just log on? You just log on. Okay. And yes, I'll be happy to send it to Tiara. I thought she was on the link that I sent the other one on, but I'll verify. And Maybe, I'm, I'm speaking for her, but she may already have it. I'm just saying that's okay. how we can get it to our ABC. Um, okay. Member. Want, I'll be happy to resend it. That's not what, what yeah, we want to do. I think I received it, but I am checking now. What we want to do, you all, can you all hear me? Because yes. I, I apologize. I had another meeting that I had to attend while you all were holding this one as well. What we want to do, these are some exciting things that you all are involved with, is post your activities to the ABC chat website because we want to feature everything that you all are involved with so that we can let our cardiology members know and be aware of what community health advocates are doing in their community on behalf of the ABC to get this important information out to the community. So we wanna make sure that we post it to the website. Yes, exactly. And, and we wanna make sure we get the word out, post it to the website so that we can, as much as possible, have individuals join, so yes. And we also have a newsletter. The, um, the ABC has newsletters that they email to all of their members. So I want to see how we can send this out to let them know so that they can get firsthand information through their emails and not just be driven to the website to see what you all are doing. So should we, if Tiara has it, will Tiara be able to post it to the website and get that information out to ABC? Yes, yes. And also when we'll you do sure. that, mention the newsletter and I will uh, follow up with that. Okay. We will send it out. So I'll do that shortly. Good. Okay, so, so as you can see, you know, you're doing a lot of activities. Now, ABC is going to want to work with you in the coming months to do a couple of things. Um, one, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we know that there are a lot of health disparities in our community. Those health disparities are caused by a lot of different factors. We talked about food deserts, but there are other barriers that exist in our community as well. And what we're going to want to do with you, working with your leadership group, um, working with you, is to start trying to codify, start trying to figure out, well, what are those barriers that exist, really defining the gap? And when we say to do that, that's going to mean looking at data collection strategies, right? So you're doing a lot of activities. We're going to want to organize some of those activities. And, and you know, I, I know you're organized, but what I mean is we're going to want to gather data from those activities. We're going to want to get information from those activities. How many people are joining? Uh, can we do better in terms of outreach? Because when we start looking at data collection, when we look at how many people are attending, then we can start also looking at, well, what are some better outreach strategies? Who are we reaching? Are we limiting our activities just to the church? You know, our church is in a community. And how do we begin to reach the broader community as well? But we also want to look at what are some of those gaps because we're going to want to look at, one, what are some of those things we're going to have to do to address those gaps? So I mentioned earlier that, hey, you know, if you have a van, like say the church has a van, and, and of course, you know, this is something we got to talk about. You know, there are certain issues that we'll have to work out, liability issues and so forth. But can you organize for the community 
where you have it where they drive to um, 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 the um, grocery stores so that they can get healthy access to foods. The, the community gardens, how many people are benefiting from the community gardens? How many people get foods from it? So we're gonna wanna think about data collection, but we're also gonna wanna think about what are those activities we need to do to begin to address some of those barriers? One of the activities is gonna be partnership development, right? So um, two months ago, we had the vaccination activity. And an important part of the vaccination activity was learning how to develop those partnerships with individuals that administer the vaccine so that we can get it into our community. Ms. Taylor just mentioned that in, for communities in Mississippi that are having a hard time getting access to the vaccines, partnering with community um, health centers in the communities is something that we wanna look at doing. So we're gonna wanna take an assessment of what do we have in our community? Who do we need to partner with? How do we need to really work towards addressing barriers that exist to good heart health? Then once we've done some of those analysis, once we've analyzed, okay, well, this is what our community has and doesn't have. These are the barriers. These are some of the activities that we can do. We want to gather data to say that we're doing these certain activities. And one of the important parts of this program is that we are training community health advocates. So at the end of this, we want you to be the voice, the advocate for your community to go out and do activities that help with community advocacy. And then we're gonna to wanna to gather data and information on that too. So you not only teach the manual, not only do some of those community activities, but how else, what are other ways that we can use community health advocates to help bridge the gap between our health system and our hard to reach community? Um, that could include being that, that go-to source in the community. So with the very first presentation I gave to the group, it was about the use of community health advocates, community health workers, promotors, whatever you want to call them, in being that bridge to the community. And so how else can we use you in that capacity to help your community members um, with this program? Now, we're going to have to discuss this later. Um, we're in talks with uh, Association of Black Cardiologists right now. But how also can we take all that information? We want to implement the program. We want to do these activities. We want to gather the data. And part of that is going to also be to take all of that to try to figure out how we can get more resources in the community to do these activities. A lot of you have mentioned about, hey, we're working with NIH. Hey, we're working with CDC. We're doing these activities. So it, would it be possible to maybe apply for grants or maybe apply for resources or maybe to try to get more um, resources in um, from either the state government, the local government, or even the national government to say, hey, let's start building capacity and our ability of our churches and our community health advocates to do activities that help our community. And then lastly, I think one of the things that we wanna consider is then how to maybe partner with other groups, working with the Association of Black Cardiologists, working with our community health centers, working with other national organizations to really start using programs like this to help the community to start addressing those health disparities. My hand is up, Dr. Ivy. I don't know how to put it on this thing. It's usually a spot down there. But listen, uh, uh, you're talking about gathering, uh, uh, building collab collaborative uh, efforts. I wonder how for this group, we, we've done some things for other groups we're part of. I wonder for this group, how we can, uh, with some of the resources or the connections that ABC has, how can we connect with our farmer's market here? We have a large uh, African-American owned farmer's market here. Uh, and uh, we have, they will say we have 20 people that we have in our program. And when we're in the community teaching, uh, they have found some, re we've connected with several organizations to where twice a month, 
those participants in the class get a box of fresh fruits and vegetables delivered to the church and the, that the church is the hub or wherever you want it delivered to. And it, we have a time scheduled and people come and pick those up. Uh, also the State Department of Health, and I think it's with the, the Department of Agriculture have some vouchers uh, that they give out to where people can either go to the farmer's market or go, go to the, far, the farm itself which is located uh, in Jackson, or go down to the farmer's market, uh, which is open uh, on Saturdays and I think on Thursdays. So uh, we're talking about uh, uh, fruit deserts, I mean, uh, uh, food deserts, then that might be an approach we can take because we do, have this Mississippi is agriculture. So there are uh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables uh, uh, available transportation as you talked about is it as we talked about it's an issue access uh, uh, money wise might be uh, although they will take food stamps at some of these places so and and then of course we do have money for groceries we we do work so uh, that and then the other thing uh, I have just been really impressed with the demonstrations you use and people learn uh, and they will talk about that. You, I, when you say there's 10 cubes of uh, sugar in, into a 12 ounce glass of uh, Coke, you know, uh, I, can, I can foresee people leaving the corner and say, okay, let me go get my 10 cubes of sugar. You know, it's good. <laughs> I can see it here thinking and that's, that's in their heads. So uh, that somehow for us, uh, to develop a uh, uh, the kind of demonstrations that we're going to use and have those visual aids, uh, you know, that's going to be in people's brains and minds. Yeah. Unmute. Um, I, this is Gwen. I'm sorry. I had to unmute. Um, does everyone uh, on here know about the uh, um, food? Um, opportunity that Miss Jackson just mentioned through the church. If if all of the churches, if that's just in our area, you know, I'm not sure all of the churches are participating in that, Miss Jackson, from the farmers market. It's, there are several different ways that you can come involved with the program. The way I was involved is that I'm teaching a program that's sponsored by the Mississippi State Department of Health. And because, and it's, it's tied to uh, the diabetes, National Diabetes Prevention Program. Uh, and so the participants in my program have access to it. There are three, there's a, a large program in the Delta in Greenville uh, that has access to it. Uh, and then there's other other people that may have access to it. And the reason I was mentioning, it may be a way that the ABC can, um, and for these 13 churches, can, can talk with, uh, I think it's the Department of Agriculture. I can get more information and maybe the ABC can lobby for us to get those resources for this, because we're going to be teaching the same kinds of health related heart issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's me advocating to on behalf of me and these 13 churches to you, the ABC. Right, and we need the in information if you would provide okay, the information. I will certainly do that. And, certainly do that. and, uh, and so that these churches, uh, the people who are here representing the other churches know about what the program is, even though mm -hmm. You know, if we find that the ABC, you know, we have to check everything out with our CEO and leadership. If it were up to Daphne and I, we would say yes to everything. Right. Okay. But I would tell you, I'll just add this. Now, we do have resources right here on our Zoom to start the biggest garden you ever wanted. <laughs> we have we have a chief, but we don't have what do they say? We don't have the workers. Uh -huh. <laughs> but Daphne, uh, Dr. Ferdinand, is a master gardener. And we don't have to have a field. 
we can have some boxes somewhere. And if we want a big prize- I'm also a Mississippi Master Gardener. Okay, so we can, we got some gardeners here and I can bring you, you know, just pass whatever you need. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just lift up and pass you whatever you need. But we do have, uh, you know, we have a lot of resources. And, you know, this is not a good time, of course, and the, our weather is not good. But those are all the kinds of things that as a group, you know, we can investigate. Right. I'm not, also I'm not very good at all with that, but I had tomato plants that until the frost stopped it. In fact, there's still some cherry tomatoes on the ground that from two little pots I had that just produced and produced and produced. So, you, you know, even if all 13 of us just did something like that, that would be great. We could also take a look because there are some, um, if churches are looking at opening food banks, mm -hmm. um, there are some grants available out there and we would have to do a little research and do some applications. Some of them start as early as this month and in, um, the grant applications have to be in by July, but that's another avenue that we could possibly look at for the groups, for the churches. That would be great. Can you send that out, Mary? Sure. Okay. So, so as you can see, you know, we're all doing a lot of activities. One of the things we're going to need to do is start organizing, just like Ms. Taylor was saying, which churches are doing what, right? So I can help to develop a spreadsheet. We can figure out which churches are doing what activities, what activities can be scaled up, right? So it sounds like right now, not all 13 churches are doing the activities that Ms. Jackson was talking about. Maybe there are resource limitations that not all churches can do the exact ones. But can we find substitutes? Can we find other ways? You know, I would imagine that it sounds like Mississippi state government is sponsoring this. So why can't they get involved in all 13 churches? Or if all 13 churches isn't possible, is there a church that's at more need, right? There might be a church that, hey, they're in a, in a really bad situation. They're further out. You know, their members are more spread out. They're more rural. And they really need it. And so helping us to develop, or let's organize our efforts. Let's figure out who's doing what. Let's figure out where resources or what's needed. You know, one church might have a food desert problem. Another church may not have the food desert problem, but they have a problem with exercise areas, right? They don't have a walking trails, right? We need to, in order to start, to start really looking at how we tackle this, we need to one, define what we're doing, who's doing what, what needs to be done where, where are the gaps? And so ABC, and, and I, you know, I definitely hear Ms. Taylor and, and Dr. Ferdinand that now I don't want to bite off more than ABC can chew. So, but what <laughs> we want to do is we st want to start thinking about this and then start organizing it in a way that we can one, you know, make sure we're doing the right thing. Two, make sure that the efforts that we're doing are having a result. You know, right now we're probably just doing the activity and we're not collecting any data. So we don't know if our activity is having any success or not. I, now, please don't get me wrong. It's wonderful, it's wonderful that you already have a lot of these activities planned. But we wanna also start thinking about data collection because we wanna make sure our efforts are having the reaction, they're having the outcome that we hope, you know, it reminds me of what we use a lot in the public health sphere as an example is back in the, what was it, the 80s, you know, um, Ronald Reagan's wife, was it Nancy Reagan? Mm -hmm. You know, she said, hey, I'm going to, we're going to have some effort to try to reduce drug use, right? So we're going to have this don't use drugs campaign. And she threw it out there and hey, yeah, don't use drugs, don't use drugs. No, she said, then, just say no. <laughs> just say no. Yeah, just say no, right? But, you know, years later, and, and right now, public health um, universities use this as the primary example of a pro how a program doesn't work, right? Because she, <laughs> they blasted out there, hey, don't use drugs, just say no, just say no. But it didn't work because the community didn't have the ability to just say no. You, you, you have to add more to that. 
But you've got to collect data to show that you need more. Yes. Well, what about be best? Was that better than be best? Because I, I still have to figure out what we're supposed to be best at. Exactly. So I'm not going there because that's all over. Ex so, so, so that highlights that data collection is very important, right? We want to continue to do these activities, but we also want to think about how we put it in the context of a program. We collect data. We try to demonstrate that the activities that we're doing are having some type of result. Otherwise, we're just doing activities. Um, so we're, we're gonna approach in the end. I apologize if I you know, talk too long. I know we only have 10 minutes left. In the last 10 minutes, uh, well, let me first open it up to any questions or comments or, or anything like that. Does I wanna make that? one announcement. Yes. Okay, because most of the people on here are either nurses, a physician, health professionals, or uh, health educators or something of that nature, or they have some, you know, influence in their church. Um, the data for Mississippi is showing that uh, uh, about almost two weeks ago, only 17% of the people who uh, were vaccinated were African Americans. 66% of the people who were vaccinated were Caucasian. Uh, now, uh, we've been talking with Dr. Dobbs, who's our state health director, because the uh, larger number of infections and deaths were in the African-American community. And he's very interested in getting, you know, African-Americans vaccined, uh, vaccinated. Uh, but what we found is that where they had the majority of the vaccinations uh, happen, were in the hospitals and when they moved it to, you know, the community health clinic, uh, centers and some private offices, uh, we've got more African-Americans. So please share with, you know, your family, whoever's now, I think we're in 65 and over. And we're also in 16 to 64 if you have any underlying health conditions. So please encourage people that you are in contact with who are in those categories to try to call in, continue to call to get the vac their vaccine. Yeah, and, and I just wanna say one thing before I move on. You know, you, you bring up a really good point. You know, data is very important. And you, you just said that data show that only 17% of African-Americans um, have no, gotten vaccinated. Of now, the people who were vaccinated. Of the people who were vaccinated, only 17% were African-Americans. Now, for another, you know, with, with working with ABC, you know, I looked at the demographics of Jackson. And I, I don't want to be wrong, so I'm going to say, from what I saw for Jackson, Mississippi, it's 80% African-Americans, right? No. So it's, it's, well, oh, Jackson. 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 Yes, he's yeah. correct. Yeah, on yeah. Jack, I was eighty percent of hey. Jackson is African Americans, and I I don't know if that that um the data you gave for seventeen percent of all Mississippi, but you know you have a situation where most of your city is African Americans, but only seventeen percent of them have been back um, of, of the people vaccinated. So that shows us that there's a huge disparity. Mm -hmm. Why out of eighty percent only seventeen? percent were vaccinated. That, that's a huge disproportion, particularly when you consider that most of Jackson is African-American. So that shows where data becomes very important because it's not just 17%, but it's, you know, you didn't take in that whole, that Jackson is mostly black, but we're not getting access. Um, it's where they provide in the vaccines. Yes. Right. And, and then her stats were state stats, not the city of Jackson. Not the city, yeah. Yeah. So, so you've got to be aware that there may be a slight yeah. difference in the in the numbers. Yeah. yeah, but but just to bring up the point that we need data, we, we need to figure out to, how to show that that one we need more because we got to make our argument right. Eventually, we want to use this for advocacy. That means trying to convince, you know, state people, city people to put resources into this. Um, we got to get the data to help us there. Now, um, just so that I won't go over. 
So um, next week is going to be our last session for Train the Trainer. We, we, I think we have one or two sessions that we want to do um, teach backs. Um, and, you know, the groups, you know who you are. In addition to that, though, we are going to have the post test next week. So we need everybody to show up on time so that we can do the post test in a timely manner. Next month. Next month. Yes, next month on, at the next session. Next month. So back in February. In addition to doing the po um, post test, we also want to have a graduation. Now, we had our graduation already for New Orleans. You know, they're your sister group. It was very nice in that we were able to present everybody and have their certificate showed and, and had that. We want to do something again. We might have to, consider you're a larger group, we'll have to figure out with the time and all, but we want to have your graduation next week also. So ahead of the, our next session in February next month, we won. So the teach back groups, you know who you are. Um, please let me know if you need help preparing for your teach back session. Because next week, uh, next month, I don't teach at all. I'm going to be strictly listening. Um, we're going to do, I had to have time for the post test. We want everybody on time and on that because we're going to need your post test results. That helps us to get the data. And then we want to do some graduation activities. Now, Tierra might reach out to you about getting your picture for it and planning. We want to have something kind of little, a look a little jazzy for you. Maybe we'll play a little bit of music and celebrate that you finished the course. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending the session today. Yes, Ms. Jackson. Listen, I want, I need for you to please send us that, uh, uh, you said you would, compile a file for us to say what the churches are doing. I yes. know that a lot of churches that are part of us are already doing some things like I know Pearl Street gives baskets once a, a month or twice a month. So uh, I, I send it, send what you want so that you can capture the data you need and send it as soon as you can, Dr. Ivy, please. Okay. And what I might do is develop a, a spreadsheet yeah. Um, I'll put all of the list of all the church's names and then we'll activity. Then we'll start propagating. We'll keep it, right? Okay, because yes. Think about activities that can be spread out. You know, there might be some situations that churches are doing certain activities on a grant. We can't really grow that right now, but it's something to think about. But I'll develop a spreadsheet so that we can keep track of those things. I'd like to say something, Dr. Ivy. Yes. I want to thank everybody for their participation. But what's so important for us moving forward is for you all to give us some detailed feedback about the training program. Please let us know what we could do better because we plan on taking this training on the road to other cities across the country. So your feedback, as critical as you can make it, is extremely important for us to make any improvements in our training program and how we present it to you all and to other uh, community health advocates that we're going to be recruiting in the future. So we really would appreciate that between now and the 20th is just start reflecting on some of um, the, your, your, just your thoughts about the program. Thank you. Okay, and I see that Dr. Underwood, you joined us. Did you want to have, uh, make any comments before we adjourn? No, really, I just want to underscore what uh, Dr. Ferdinand just said in terms of making sure that you give us feedback so that we can change the program to try to improve it, to make it applicable to all. We have been extremely pleased with the progress that we've made and we want to share this with people across the country and your participation and the hard work and the enthusiasm that you've done has really inspired us quite a bit in terms of ABC, and we want to take this message even further. So you can help us tremendously by just providing us feedback. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. Wonderful. So that um, concludes our, our, our time for today. I know that we're at time. Thank you everyone for joining us and being on these sessions. Thank you to the group that presented today. You did a wonderful job at doing your teach backs. Um, if the group for next month um, that are doing the teachbacks, 
if you, if you need any assistance from me, please let me know. Um, otherwise, thank you everyone for attending the session today. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank next, you. Next month. Next month. Next month. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, Bye everyone. everybody. Thank you, Dr. Ivy. Thank you.